Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the March 12th, 2019 Board of Supervisors meeting. I'm gonna uh, call the meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Good morning. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Brent. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. And Chair Kunichi. Here. Thank you. Uh, so now is our opportunity, uh, we're gonna have a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, Mr. Palacios, do we have any uh, late additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, yes, we have a, a number, we have a late addition and a number of c uh, corrections to the agenda. Uh, so the first thing uh, we'd like to ask is for the board to consider a late addition of item uh, file ID 6850 to the regular agenda relating to a proposed cannabis equity ordinance in order to remain eligible for the Board of Cannabis Control's local equity grant program as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Leopold and Supervisor Coonerty. Um, there's a memo of Supervisors Leopold and uh, Coonerty attached, and this will uh, require a four-fifths vote of the board to place it on today's agenda. Okay, uh, so why don't we do that right now? Uh, so this is a, um, just by way of background, this is an opportunity at the state level to access funds to help uh, communities that were disproportionately impacted uh, by the by the criminalization of marijuana to now be able to access uh, trainings and wa fee waivers for um, uh, to participate in the emerging legal cannabis community uh, opportunities. Uh, it comes at no cost to the county and in fact would provide us a petition, uh, potentially uh, additional funding uh, to assist these businesses. <coughs> so uh, right now we would need, uh, um, uh, a motion and a second and then a four-fifths vote to add it to the agenda today. Uh, I would make that motion. So we got a motion by Leopold, a second by McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So that passes unanimously. That will now become item 10, uh, sorry, 10.2 on our agenda later today. <coughs> okay, so that, um with that vote, uh, item 10.2 is added, which is to consider a proposed ordinance amending the Santa Cruz County Code by adding uh, chapter 7.136 relating to cannabis equity and schedule final adoption for March 26, 2019 as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Leopold and Supervisor Coonerty. There's a memo attached as well as the draft ordinance and the local equity program mm -hmm. grant guidelines. Uh, there's also a request to add an addenda to the regular agenda. Uh, this is item 10.1. This is to consider final reappointment of Andy Schifrin to the Housing Board of Authority Commissioners as an at-large representative for a term to expire March 17th, 2023. Uh, on the consent agenda, <coughs> item 28, there's a correction. The item should read to return uh, in June 2019 for award of contract as recommended by the planning director and then there's an addenda to the consent agenda, item 40.1, which is adopt resolution in support of Assembly Bill AB 705 Stone to protect the county's mobile home park conversion ordinance and direct the chair of the board to send a letter to our legislative delegation indicating our position as recommended by Supervisor uh, Leopold. That concludes our uh, additions and corrections to the agenda. Thank you very much. Um, now is an opportunity for board members to remove an item uh, from the consent agenda and put it onto the regular agenda. Supervisor Caput. Uh, I won't remove anything. I, uh, I'll just make a, a comment. Well, uh, Supervisor, that'll be, um, that'll be, we'll do that under item six. Uh, this is just after public comment. Okay. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. I, um, 
I'd like to pull um, item number 35, the request for proposals uh, for recycling center operation services. Okay, so uh, item number 35 will become item 9.1 uh, on our agenda. Supervisor Friend, Supervisor Leopold. I have nothing to pull. Okay. Now is an opportunity uh, for members of the public to speak to us about items that are on our consent agenda or uh, in closed session or uh, are uh, not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the board. Um, this is, uh, and uh, so I'll ask those who uh, want to to step up and uh, we'll have three minutes per person. <coughs> Good morning, Chair Coonerty, members of the board. I'm speaking today as um, Jillian Ritter, co-chair of the Santa Cruz County Holiday Food Drive from 2018. Um, I wanna share with you that last Wednesday at the um, Second Harvest Food Drive Awards Dinner, the county regained the President's Cup um, for the past two years. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> for the past two years, um, Dignity Health has won the President's Cup and we're happy to report that it has returned home and we raised over 300,000 meals in order to, to win this back. So thank you for your support. Um, thank you to all the members of the county for, for helping us get this back. Well, thank you very much. Thank and uh, where's the, the rest of your crew with your outfits on? You know, really, come on. <laughs> we weren't dressing up today, okay, sorry. You were not, okay, low key, huh? All right, low thank key. you. Thank you. Good morning, um, my name is Michelle Averill and I am the CEO for the um, Central Coast chapter of the American Red Cross and I wanted to thank you for recognizing us for March being Red Cross Month. Um, I am proud to lead a wonderful group of volunteers and doing many great things throughout our community. Um, Zach and Rick, thank you for all of your support and um, Rick's gonna say a little bit about what we do out in the community. Thank you, Michelle. Rick Martinez, uh, board member, past board chair for the Central Coast Chapter of the American Red Cross. Uh, thank you for the recognition. Uh, the Red Cross for, has been there for our county, uh, whether it's earthquakes, uh, wildland fires, home fires, floods, and even tsunamis. Uh, the Red Cross has been there for our county. So thank you for taking time out of your busy agenda to uh, recognize uh, the Central Coast Chapter and the great work that the volunteers do. Uh, and in closing, I'd really like to uh, thank you for uh, allow me to participate in an event or a meeting that Zach Friend is not emceeing or the chair of. <laughs> so thank you. We're thankful every day. Uh -huh. We know your feeling. Yeah. Good morning, Chair Coonerty and Supervisors. Karen Delaney with the Volunteer Center and um, I'm here with some colleagues to help us celebrate AmeriCorps Week. Um, AmeriCorps, as you may know, is often called the Domestic Peace Corps. It's where uh, wonderful people agree to take a year or two out of their lives and dedicate it to full-time service to making our communities better and stronger. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of AmeriCorps and AmeriCorps alums uh, throughout our community. I believe there's we are one, there's four AmeriCorps programs in uh, Santa Cruz County. We're blessed to have the work of many AmeriCorps members. Some of them are in the room. If you're an AmeriCorps member, you wanna stand up and... Um, we believe it's really important, even on the busiest of agendas, to take time and recognize when people step up and show their appreciation for our communities with rolling up their sleeves and making good things happen. That is a precious thing. It's the bedrock of a healthy community. It's the bedrock of democracy. So thank you for helping us recognize these wonderful AmeriCorps members. And we have some other, some, we're gonna hear a little bit more about AmeriCorps. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Alana Sanford and I am an AmeriCorps Fellow at the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz County. Um, I just wanted to thank you again for honoring us with um, this week for AmeriCorps Week. Um, I serve at the Volunteer Center and we have had AmeriCorps Fellows for 11 years. And in the last 11 years, we've recruited 15,000 volunteers and those volunteers have contributed 207,000 hours um, to our community which amounts to like just over $5 million in donated labor. So um, we're really proud of the work we're doing and um, we really thank you for recognizing us. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Good morning, and thank you again for showing appreciation for the AmeriCorps. Uh, how's that? Better? Thank you. My name is Linda Skeff. I'm the program director for the San Lorenzo Valley Native Habitat Restoration Program. And since 2016, the Valley Women's Club Habitat Restoration Program, along with Santa Cruz County Parks, has co-sponsored NCCC AmeriCorps teams of young adults from all over the country. And they have been here and they have contributed to the habitat restoration in the San Lorenzo Valley Valley while learning the principles of environmental preservation. Teams have spent between seven and 14 weeks working full time, eight days a week, seven days a week, five days a week, eight hours a day, and they work in rain or shine at one of 11 restoration project sites that we have. These project sites are located predominantly within the Santa Cruz County Park System and the 501c3 nonprofits that we have in our community, such as Mountain Community Resources. The 2019 AmeriCorps team will bring to our community efforts valued at over $175,000 all told for 2016, 17, 18, and 19, these young adults will have contributed 20,760 hours to our community valued at over $500,000 alone. We have also received grants to support the last four years in the Community Foundation, Santa Cruz County. Although I have the honor and the opportunity to direct this program, it is a perfect example of the amalgamation of federal, state, county, and local, and nonprofit organizations coming together for the greater good of the community. And my time is up, so I would just like to say. You have another minute. Oh, I have another minute? I would like to thank Supervisor McPherson. I would like to thank the Valley Women's Club Board and Nancy Macy, Jeff Gaffney of County Parks, he, he is the uh, Parks Director, Eric Strum, who is the Park Superintendent, and all the community members who have made this program the success it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank everybody who participates in the AmeriCorps. It's uh, phenomenal. The uh, students from throughout the nation come. They're just energized. It really gives you faith in the future when you see these people working and what they're doing for our community and throughout the United States, as a matter of fact. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. I think a lot of people don't know that there's a parallel government that's been in progress uh, for some time in the community. I'd like to put forward here the uh, regional plan by the Fabian Socialist Par Party in England, the very school that Neil Coonerty went to. I want to uh, uh, tell you what they think about regional government and how they're putting it over on you. It says that the striking illustration in the manner necessary for social and political change is to force their way b through the back entrance, meaning regional government, thus effect, in effect evading opposition. People don't know that the AMBAG meets monthly and the last time myself and one other person attended, there was only five agendas available for uh, some 12, count of 12 cities and three counties. It says in effect it leaves the people stranded. This is a value of regional government which you advocate. It says at one stroke there has been installed a system of regional government which while leaving the local authorities untouched offers a formidable challenge to the future of their existence and status. You're betraying the people that you represent here by continually uh, playing that. Uh, we've also find the coincidence. Uh, this is uh, Zygmunt Brzezinski, a co-founder with Rockefeller, Feinstein, Alan Cranston of the Trilateral Commission. The regionalization is in keeping with the trilateral pan, which calls for a convergence of the East and West, ultimately leading to a goal of world government. National sovereignty is no longer viable. That is your intent, and that is the intent of Leon Panetta, who is funded uh, by uh, various foundations. His co-chair, Lanny Mendoka, advocates uh, getting rid of 80% of local government, and you're part of that, and you're not allowed, and, and our, our council and our uh, county administrative officer are part of that. We find a proclamation in honor of communist Chinese uh, agent uh, Hugh DeLacy. We find that the person that 
attended this proclamation over the Loudon Nelson Center that all supported communist China includes Gary Patton, who supported the communist uh, takeover of Grenada, uh, building airports and Soviet uh, uh, ships, and MiGs were being uncrated at that particular time. The California dynasty of communism uh, refers to Alan Cranston. Alan Cranston had, uh, in the war office, uh, he had a man, uh, supposedly a, a foreign language person, David Carr. He did not read or speak a foreign language. Cranston wrote many articles that ended up in the communist newspapers. Uh, Goldwater says, uh, there's not enough time, the Trilateral Commission is intended as a vehicle for multinational consolidation. The so-called socialism, that you're preaching is to control and concentrate power and put these rich people in charge. Hi, my name is Bob Polaris and I uh, operate a dispensary here in Santa Cruz, a cannabis dispensary. And I'm asking that the board do something to help us um, be able to move our businesses a little easier. We have a um, situation where we found a spot to move, but it's a dual, um, there's a dual zoned lot with a commercial and a residential on it, where the residential section of the lot is over 800 feet from our parcel, but it's being deemed not acceptable. And it's basically the only place we could find in the county to move our shop, because our, our current situation, our landlord is looking to quadruple our rent when our lease is over, which will essentially put us out of business. And we're asking that the Board of Supervisors take a look at this or empower the, the cannabis authority here to help us move forward with this move so we don't have to be um, subject to ridiculous rents. We can grow our business and be successful and help the community. And we really, we really want to, but in our situation right now, if what's being proposed by our landlord, we would have to close our shop and um, not be able to provide for our families. So we ask that the board consider this and talk to the powers that be over in the cannabis to help us make this move because this residential section isn't even residential, it's zoned residential, but it's currently a loading dock so it's not being used that way. And it's over 800 feet from the parcel. So in the spirit of the law, the 300 foot setback for residential, I think we meet that requirement and ask that the board consider this. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I arrived late, I apologize. I want to ask if um, item, uh, 28 has been pulled from the consent agenda? No, it hasn't. Pardon? No, it hasn't. All right, thank you, then I will speak to that. Um, item um, 28 is to authorize a request for proposal for a consultant to do an environmental impact report um, f for the sustainable SoCal, or sustainable so Santa Cruz County plan and changes in the general plan. I um, looked yesterday in the binder at the desk and I couldn't really find much information about what that, that contract should include, but by going online at the library, I did find some information and I did uh, contact uh, Supervisor Leopold with my questions, but I have great concern that only five community meetings would be allowed or specified for uh, in this contract, and I think something of this magnitude needs to have more. It's not clear to me at what point these community meetings would occur, if um, they would be during the scoping process, if they would be during the draft EIR, it concerns me. I only see an administrative draft EIR being included in the contract, and I wonder how transparent this uh, process will be to the public. I wondered if these community meetings will be held th in every district. If that's true, then that takes up the five community meetings that are specified. So I'm not level, I'm not comfortable with the level of public outreach and interaction that's being specified in this contract proposal, and I would like more. Um, I would also like to see Spanish translation included in all of these meetings. So um, that's my uh, uh, request regarding that, and um, I also have on 
consent agenda item 33 regarding contracts for hazardous waste transportation. I would like your board to make sure that you coordinate with Public Works regarding the um, results of that Nero audit that was presented to your board by Department of Public Works um, last year, wherein the two largest haulers in the county were in violation. Um, I've been asking for a copy of that report. It has not become publicly available yet, but I want to make sure that the two largest haulers that are, have been shown in violation um, are either required to bring um, their requirements current or not be considered for any contracts that could be uh, part of um, item 33. And finally, I want to make it clear to you again that I am still um, uh, per proceeding with the uh, CEQA litigation against Soquel Creek Water District for the Pure Water Soquel Plan. They are moving quickly to secure site in Chanticleer area with many violations. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Tony Crane uh, representing a neighborhood in Aptos regarding the second story peer respite program, uh, which for the crowd is um, a an peer-run, unlicensed, unregulated crisis mental health facility with a short stay that serves over, well, it serves hundreds of people per year that was put in our neighborhood uh, without uh, coming to us at all in any way until uh, we found out where, about it. Can you just pause the t time for a second? Ms. Victorious, people need to be able to speak without uh, you having their camera in their face, so can, yeah, but I thank you. Um, we're going to make this a comfortable place, and so I'm going to ask you not to do that. Please, thank you. So uh, they did not consult us. In fact, we found out about it after the fact. They had not even told Zach about it. Um, and then uh, not only did they not consult us, but when they were confronted, they lied to us, uh, directly to us in a public meeting, and we have internal emails that we got through a public request of information that proves irrefutably that they did lie and that they had a directive to lie to the public, clear as day. Uh, Zach, you received an email uh, the other day, uh, a child, uh, while the parents were waiting for them to get out of the school that is right there, just a few hundred feet away, um, was nearly hit by a car that was driving erratically, honking their horn. Little girl panicked, ran into and almost was hit by another car. That car was that identified and the description of that car uh, was then traced back to a car sitting in the parking lot of Second Story. This is the third incident where somebody was nearly hit by somebody driving erratically in the neighborhood. The neighborhood has no safety infrastructure, no sidewalks, no street lights, windy roads. They are, the facility is right on a blind corner. It is ridiculous that you guys are allowing this place to stay where it is. That's the third incident if you don't, if you don't include the person that was arrested in front of my house on six felony warrants under the influence of heroin uh, that uh, was then directly connected to the program as well. Who knows what would have happened if that person drove out of there, took their dirty needles and threw them into the bushes in front of my house. Who knows? This is ridiculous and, and we don't understand why you've relinquished your power to the, uh, to the service uh, organiz organization that runs it. Um, you have stumbled through this thing and now the gloves are off. You guys have just disregarded our concerns for a year and a half or more. And so now we're forced to do the things that we, want, we didn't want to do. We've been nice, we've followed all the rules, and we've got nothing. We still have this program servicing people in our neighborhood, and it shouldn't be there, shouldn't be in any residential neighborhood for that matter. Thank you. Good morning, Jim Coffus uh, from Ben Lomond. I'm here speaking on behalf of Green Trade Santa Cruz, the Coalition of Cannabis uh, Businesses locally. Uh, I wanna thank the board for um, directing the chair to uh, write a letter in support of, uh, for item number 17, writing a letter in support of the uh, 
cannabis uh, tax initiative at the state level. And um, just remind the board that uh, recognizing that reducing the tax rate is an important step and that uh, we should also consider doing that locally. I'd also like to ask that uh, either individually or as a, a direction that you also support uh, State Bill 34, which will establish a, comp a compassionate use program in the state, and State Bill 67, which is a, a critical uh, bill to extend the temporary licensing. Um, both of these bills are uh, critically important to the local community and to the uh, health of the uh, cannabis trade going forward. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Chair Coonerty, Coonerty and um, uh, honorable members of the board, my name is Dan Turbyfill. I reside at 2055 Summit Drive. I'm here today um, uh, to uh, speak on behalf of a cannabis farmer that owns the property. I um, previously successfully licensed five farms in Mendocino County, and I serve uh, a, a, an alliance of 60 farmers through Mendocino Generations. And um, I'm here to thank you for uh, consent agenda item number 17 um, for, for looking to reduce the tax, and I would also encourage you to do that locally because the farmers are overtaxed and overburdened with fees and charges. I just got done paying $1,500 to get into pre-application here. And um, it's just really appreciated that you're considering it for the state. And um, just as an example, the farmer that I represent, he has a family, three young daughters. His wife is, is battling breast cancer and he's really struggling. And so any help or assistance that you can provide these farmers is really appreciated. And uh, we're, we're here with gratitude and thank you for addressing these complex issues related to cannabis regulation and um, look forward to seeing you more often. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Honorable. Board of Supervisors, thank you so much for uh, decades, really decades long support of uh, medical cannabis and in moving forward with cannabis, uh, observing the cannabis taxes. And I wanna just speak briefly um, in support of reducing taxes, of, of looking deeply at that, because there's an illusion of great wealth, at least uh, the great wealth is not something that's coming from the bottom up from small business people. And secondly, uh, I would like to uh, echo the support of a letter for SB 34, Senator Wiener's second bill, his first one, which he supported, or wrote a letter of support, um, was SB 829, which Governor Brown vetoed. We do not expect a veto from Governor Newsom, and we, we hope not, and we really would like your support on SB 34, which is the reduction of ca cannabis taxes for compassionate access. Thanks again. And this community has been echoing and applauding co compassionate access for more than two and a half decades, and I really thank you for doing that. It's brave. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I just want to remind members of the public what it is to be a good historical flag waving an American. Um, today's my birthday, March 12th. Thank you. And I want to be able to share with Santa Cruz County residents because you guys deserve, you guys deserve a lot. And I want to be able to say this, you know, I come in here and I don't come in here just for the giggles. I really want, I want us to be able to reconcile our political differences. <coughs> the tyranny of the status quo is getting a little out of, out of whack, all right? Government all ha has limits, right? And the threat from down below is real. I'm telling you guys right now, you know, I don't need the public admonishment. Don't be hostile to, to uh, modern technology. I have to video record this because the Santa Cruz County uh, Community Television want to blotch uh, Gary's public comment, which I do appreciate your leadership, Gary. Coming into this chamber, having the moral courage to be able to, uh, uh, pontificate on that deep state analysis. 
okay? And not only that, but help illuminate members of the public and connect that dots. And I do appreciate that, right? And I wanna be able to share with members of the public my latest book that I'm, I'm reading. It's called uh, None Dare Call It Con uh, Treason, but Gary Arnold will, will straight up call it treason, right? And Victoria Alexander and his constituents are gonna support that, all right? I wanna be able to share with members of the public that I attended the Watsonville City Council meeting and uh, Carlo Palacio resides in, in, uh, in Watsonville. And they're a wonderful uh, 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 political community that welcome members of the public to participate. And on their consent agenda, they allow members of the public, you're going a little fast on that time, all right? So they got stipulated language and I wanna share with members of the public, they can go online and watch that. That was, uh, uh, that was, uh, I believe that was uh, the date, uh, February 12th. The Capitola, February 14th, I did the public comment in the consent agenda. They have stipulated language, Chairman Friend. They have stipulated language in your district, allow members of the public to weigh on the consent agenda. I went to the Gilroy uh, City Council meeting, uh, March 4th, people can watch the public comment there. It's a great public comment, right? There's three realms I can dominate in, the political arena, the public square, because I'm not ashamed of my humanity, and my creativeness with my YouTube videos that I'm gonna be producing, and my graphics, right? I, I gave this package to Carlos Palacio, Dana, and also to Zach Friend. Thank you, time's up. And I wanna be able to say that to Zach Friend, just complaining that I didn't, that I didn't spell his name correctly. So, yeah, I don't understand. Thank you, thank you, your time's up. What I'm giving you. Mr. Alexander, thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, Paulina Moreno with Community Action Board. I'm also here representing the County Census Committee and I'd like to invite you all and the public to please join us. Um, tomorrow we have our second complete count committee meeting. Uh, we're gearing up for the census. And so I'd like to extend an invitation to everyone to please join us. Uh, it will take place at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning at Cabrillo Cessnan House. And for all of you, know, we're, we're working towards um, developing an outreach and implementation plan for Santa Cruz County, and we really need the voices of all organizations and folks uh, in order to ensure an accurate and complete count for the 2020 census. So again, uh, please join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. at Cabrillo Cessna House um, for our second complete count committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you, and it's critical that we count every person for the census. That concludes public comment. I'm now gonna bring it back to the board for action on the consent agenda. These, these are items 12 through 40 with the exception of item number 35. <coughs> Do we have a motion? Okay. Well, well, a comment. Thank okay, you. oh sorry, comments now. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get that, you bet. <coughs> on uh, item 17, I, I've heard people uh, say that uh, for the compassionate use of the uh, lowering the tax and actually eliminating, I guess, uh, they're proposing for three to four years uh, the uh, the state tax on marijuana. I, I don't see it where it's just for compassionate use, medical use. I, I believe it's straight across the board. A am I correct on that? This so, particular bill uh, is just is a, is about across the board. There's another bill that has to do with compassionate use. Right. So this bill is across the board, though. Correct. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, the, the concern I have is uh, we're reacting to the black market. It's like the black market is uh, telling us what to do, and no matter what how we shift, we've shifted in the past in order to try to get a, uh, you know lower the black market. Now, if we eliminate the tax, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's taking money away from law enforcement that would be able to enforce the laws that we do have concerning can, uh, cannabis. Um, and then the other would be uh, uh, the analysis uh, before was um, when they did uh, when they did a study on how uh, tax money would be used to enforce this and actually get around the black market, 
they, they're using now the same argument to eliminate the tax. So I, what I'm getting at is, uh, the point I'm getting at here is, I mean, how far are we gonna go uh, and how low are we gonna go on the taxes in order to accommodate uh, uh, the proposed uh, cannabis uh, rules that we had from the state in the beginning and now it's changing. So I'll be voting no on 17. <clears throat> if it was for compassionate use or medical use, uh, exceptions, I would go for that, but uh, this is across the board. <coughs> so anyway, on 17, I'll be voting no. And then, uh, <coughs> let me see here. Uh, on item uh, 26, <coughs> that's uh, with the set aside money. I've noticed that the, uh, uh, the, the amount of time <coughs> would actually begin from today, at, uh, it started already, I guess, at eight o'clock today or would start after our vote. And then uh, it, they only have for the set aside money until April the 7th in order to get their uh, request in. Uh, for some of these uh, organizations, especially the smaller ones, I think we're, we're making it, we're making that uh, amount of time too short. They don't they don't have uh, staff in order to write up uh, the hard copy that's required by five o'clock on April seventh. <coughs> so I'm offering a friendly uh, amendment just to extend that time uh, in t uh, until April the tenth, which would be a Friday, uh, which would be a Tuesday rather than the Friday. So. Anyway, uh, I'm just asking to extend it a little bit uh, for, uh, for people and good organizations that do not have a lot of staff in order to do all this paperwork, uh, that uh, they're given uh, three more days. Sure, and I'm getting a uh, head nod uh, from the director of HSD that that would be okay with her. Okay, I, uh, do we need to have a vote on an amendment? On yeah, I think it's additional direction that'll be incorporated into the motion. Okay, so it would be April 10th, mm -hmm. that's fine, okay. And then the last one is just a question on, uh, I believe, let me see here. <laughs> uh, item 35, uh, that's uh, with the uh, Buena Vista landfill and the Ben that, Lomond that, transfer uh, sir, station. That got, that got pulled and it'll be on our it's regular pulled. agenda. Okay, then that's fine. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, not to be confrontational, but I am in strong support of item 17. Um, the, the, when this whole cannabis industry became uh, somewhat what you call legalized in California, that uh, the taxing structure was uh, a key part of that. Uh, I think the state really overreached in uh, setting a 15% uh, tax, excise tax, and I strongly agree that we should uh, uh, support lowering, having the state lower that to 11%. Uh, I think it has had a, uh, we want to reduce the, the strength of the black market. Uh, I'm not sure that the tax structure is gonna be the thing that does this, but coupled with the taxes that we as a county put on, which I know uh, uh, you remember that I, I thought we should have started lower, but overall the income from uh, the cannabis tax has not been with the state nor the county projected and I've asked uh, the County State Association of, uh, uh, California State Association of Counties to look at has the high tax structure in some uh, regions uh, lowered the tax revenue that uh, we might have anticipated. Uh, I don't know that answer right now. I suspect it might be right, but I think a high tax structure, the combination of the state and county of being over 30%, um, is extremely high and does nothing to weaken the black market element of this whole subject matter. So I am st in strong support of reducing that tax and I've always been in support of the compassionate tax uh, element of that as uh, we know, uh, Ms. Corral knows uh, through the years. Uh, she's done a fantastic job and ev other, it's a model of what others should be doing for compassionate use. So I just uh, strongly support uh, item 17 and I think that uh, we might be taking a, a I hope we might be taking a look at that. If I have more evidence to see, uh, or the county or the state does, that um, high taxes are 
uh, put in a, a, a stymieing the, uh, the effort to reduce the strength of the black market. Um, and also a number, uh, item number uh, 26, uh, the core base, the collective uh, of results and evidence-based programs. We're just asking for uh, people to submit applications. Uh, we, as a, as a county, uh, allocated more than $4 million for community service uh, programs. Uh, really, a, a really a great effort. I think this has shown to be an efficient and effective use of way we should distribute those funds in core. Uh, there is this element of um, set aside of funds of $150,000. Uh, there's much more need than that. We know that. Uh, as a matter of fact, last year, I think 39 agencies uh, made submitted uh, proposals for almost $800,000. We were able to give 15 agencies a total of $150,000, ranging from uh, 3000 to 23000 I'd just like to inter uh, uh, really to try to encourage those uh, community nonprofit agencies to make their applications if they wish. The fund <laughs> is limited to $150,000, but I do think we we're putting it to good use, and I appreciate everything that these community organizations have done for Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Just a couple of uh, items to comment on uh, and one additional uh, direction. Uh, I will echo my colleagues' uh, comments on item number 17 about uh, reducing taxes. We have a, uh, we are, what we are seeing across the state is that it's hard to move people into a legal uh, structure if we place so many uh, uh, hurdles in front of them. Um, over 30 percent of the taxes is one of those hurdles, and we should work to uh, reduce that. And the state uh, seems to be taking uh, some leadership in at least trying it for a three-year period to reduce a portion of the taxes on uh, for the state taxes. Um, also, I'd just like to comment on item number 22, which is the probation department uh, Prop 47 grant application. Uh, this seems like a very powerful uh, application that will do a lot of good in our community uh, to address mental health and substance use disorder services and uh, building on an effort that the community is increasingly interested in is, is some restorative justice pieces. And uh, I'm hopeful that we can, uh, that we will uh, be able to access these grants. The, the amount of money that would come in would be significant and would really make a big difference um, in our community. And I applaud the probation department for seeking these funds and working with so many other partners in the community to help make this application um, uh, competitive. On item number 23, I just want to uh, recognize the sheriff's department for its ongoing commitment uh, for gender-specific in-custody treatment programming. Um, the sheriff and uh, his office has been very supportive of an effort which this board has supported in looking at the issues of women in our criminal justice system. And uh, this uh, grant will help uh, with a program at Blaine Street. And I appreciate their leadership in seeking out these funds. On item number 28, uh, which is the RFP for this, uh, uh, the EIR on our sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. This has been long uh, uh, discussed, and I'm glad to see this moving forward. I held off this item uh, last week because I wanted to talk with staff because in the initial draft of that RFP, there were some items that were unfamiliar to me. And after spending some time with some staff, I, uh, I learned a lot. They also reminded me of some elements that we approved back in 2015. Um, and I want to uh, add an additional direction uh, to direct uh, the staff to return on or before June 11th uh, with a sustainability policy and regulatory update study session to provide information to the board on the scope and elements of the sustainable update that have either changed or been added since the original adoption of sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. Um, additional information on how the state and local land uses with respect to the accessory dwelling units and bonus density ordinance will interface with the proposed changes. I, I have this written down, so I'll give it to you. Uh, but uh, the, one of the things that's become clear is that through uh, uh, state law changes um, and increasing um, level of sophistication by the staff and understanding about what we could do 
uh, in order to meet the goals of the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan. They're suggesting some additional changes, and I thought it would be helpful before we hire the EIR consultant that we at least get a review of what those pieces were so we're aware uh, of what it is we're hiring and going to be studying. And uh, I've talked with uh, planning department and their support of that, and so they would work uh, with the CAO to study that session. I hope that would be supported by the board. Um, and lastly, I just want to uh, urge the support of my colleagues on item 40.1, which is the support of AB 705. Um, this bill by our local assembly member, Mark Stone, uh, will add some uh, important protections to mobile home uh, law uh, to um, cut off the practice that, that has been used in other communities to get around uh, the conversion, mobile home conversion law uh, by uh, uh, instigating a closure uh, and then coming back later with a, a project. There is, there is some uh, crafty ways in which uh, mobile home park owners have tried to get around uh, <coughs> conversion laws, and this bill will be an important way to stop that, and I hope the board will support it. That's Thank it. you. Um, let me just say, Supervisor Caput, I share your concerns, and the reason that I'm supporting item number 17 today is the state seems set an incredibly high tax, does none of the work, puts all the work on us, and puts pressure on us to, for us to lower our taxes uh, because of the uh, implement because of the uh, the black market pressures. So the reason I'm supportive of this is I think the state should lower their taxes hopefully do more work uh, and uh, leave us uh, with the resources to, to implement this program. So that's, that's why I'm coming to it uh, uh, from that perspective. But I will take a motion with the additional direction. I would move the, the consent agenda as amended. Okay, motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Except for 17. Okay, so that passes unanimously with the exception of 17. Um, we are now on to our regular agenda, and the first item up is one of our favorite days of the year here at the Board of Supervisors, because it's the presentation of the 2018 Employee Recognition Awards, as outlined in the memorandum of the CAO, and um, it's just an extraordinary opportunity for us to hear about and recognize um, the thousands of people who come to work every day for this county of Santa Cruz uh, to serve our community and and make our make our community a better place and so we're we're grateful to have this opportunity and I'm going to ask the CAO to introduce this item. Uh, yes, Chair Coonerty and members of the board, uh, this is program is a special effort that the board established a number of years ago to recognize and show appreciation to our employees for their outstanding accomplishments during the past year. Some of the criteria that we use in evaluating these awards is an employee or group of employees who solve an extraordinary problem for the county an employee or group of employees who successfully implement an innovative idea, uh, a group of employees or employee who does an outstanding act which brings, uh, deserves recognition from the, to the county, and an employee or a group of employees who performs their work in a, a way that deserves special recognition. Uh, with that, uh, today's ceremony, uh, what we'll have is each board member will present an award in one of the five categories of government. Uh, board members will come down and stand at the microphone. As employees hear their name, um, they should uh, come up to the front and join the supervisor. And at the conclusion of the awards event, uh, there will be a reception in the hall adjacent to the board chambers. Everyone is invited to stay through the entirety of the presentation of the awards and for the uh, reception. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty will be presenting our first awards in the category of general government. All right, so our uh, first category is in the uh, bronze, the bronze award, and it's shared by members of the countywide solar installation team, and including, and I'm gonna ask you to come up, William Kirsten, Al Galvan, Ben Winkleback, Black, Kevin Fitzgerald, Robert Calisiano, and Lieutenant Fred Pleishman. Come on up. Uh, so this countywide solar installation, 
solar installation team was a cross-departmental collaborative effort to install solar panels at eight county locations, including the main building, our Emmeline campus, Animal Services, Brommer Maintenance Yard, the Center for Public Safety, Simpkins, uh, and the Men's Detention Center. They met with Contractors identified and, and mitigated parking and business building access issues, participated in weekly meetings related to projects. Their assistance with the duties kept the project on schedule with minimum impacts to operations. This team is being celebrated today for bringing significant benefits to the county. And let me just say, essentially what it did was reduce our, so, our solar, our, our energy usage by half and will save taxpayers about $20 million over the next 20 years by providing a more green, um, a, a green approach to our energy um, and being responsive for demands for alternative energy sources. I commend and thank the county solar-wide installation team for their hard work on this important project. Thank you very much. Our silver award winner is the General Services Fleet Division, and uh, I'm going to ask Jose Rocha, Robert Sandoval, Randall uh, Matajic, and Jonathan Rector to come forward. So wait till you, you're already applauding, but wait till you hear what they did. Uh, <laughs> during a routine stop made by a sheriff deputy in May of 2018, a person was able to gain access to the vehicle's driver's side and drive the vehicle into the deputy. This incident exposed a vulnerability in the rear window security bars. As a result, the fleet services team quickly designed a security screen to reinforce the re rear windows of the detainee uh, area of the vehicle. This design was installed in more than 30 vehicles in less than two months. This innovative design and efficient installation led to better security and safety for deputies and the public. The team has gone above and beyond to prevent a circumstance in which a high risk and high harm events might occur. I'm delighted to uh, present Fleet Services with the Silver Award today in general government. Uh, and finally, our uh, gold winners today are the benefits team. Uh, so Michelle, there we go. <laughs> uh, personnel is always uh, always ready to cheer folks on. All right, Michelle uh, Resendez, Robert Urich, Leticia Preciado, Francesca Diaz, and Tom uh, Malokian. Malconian. Malconian. Sorry. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> So uh, this was a departmental collaborative effort between personnel benefits team and information services uh, staff to overhaul and transform the way the benefits team was providing services to employees. Some of these services include providing information about employee health, dental and vision and life insurance, as well as initial and annual employee health insurance enrollment. Benefits Information Services work together to transform the benefits webpage and elevate the open enrollment process by allowing forms to be completed, signed, and submitted electronically. This team has also tested these new process, processes extensively in order to, to ensure their success. I am proud to present the benefits team with the gold award in general government, and thank you for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Leopold will now be presenting awards in the category of health services. I don't think those applause were for me. <laughs> uh, uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge that uh, the entire board recognizes that we are very fortunate to have a talented county family uh, with many dedicated uh, and hardworking individuals who make county government possible. Today we recognize uh, some of them, but we appreciate the work that all of our employees do every day. Uh, 
In the health services category in the bronze award, the, this award is being awarded to the jail behavioral health team. That includes Rob Vickers, Malka Friedman, Jeffrey Goodyear, James Russell, Brenda Campbell, Robert uh, Anon, Dr. Oya Soizel, Dr. Karsten Heal, and James Reggio. Uh, <laughs> members of the jail behavioral health team are regularly faced with jail overcrowding and a high number of individuals with mental illness who are in custody. The team displays collaboration, respect, support, and trust while working under incredibly challenging and stressful conditions. Uh, participating in daily multidisciplinary multi team meetings to review the cases and needs of inmates with a variety of treatment needs. Members of this team provide quality services while supporting individuals in their stabilization, recovery, and successful reentry, and linkage to supports in the community. Please join me in congratulating the Jail Behavioral Health Team on their bronze award in the health services category. Next, we have our Silver Award winner, Kim Chavez. She may only be one. She only be, may only be one person, but she has very loud fans. <laughs> Kim has worked for the county in juvenile hall for over 23 years, and she consistently demonstrates her commitment to inclusive and exemplary care and services to the to an often underserved population. Kim has been one of the primary providers coordinating and providing medical services at Juvenile Hall, and she ensures that every youth receives individualized and high-level care. She has always gone above and beyond and has stepped up, especially in the past couple of years, to work many overtime shifts in order to meet medical requirements, and always with a smile on her face. Kim is a model county employee, and I'm proud to present her with the Silver Award today. <laughs> Competition is tough at the health services category, but we have a two-way tie for uh, gold. So the, f the first gold award winner in health services is an individual, Shannon Shakespeare Leon. Uh, in her role as a medical assistant, Shannon supports the work of the integrated behavioral health team at Emmeline, comprised of 10 licensed direct service providers. Shannon has an extraordinary workload due to the support she was required to provide but she approaches, approaches everything that she does with immense patience and caring towards the people her team serves and goes above and beyond in her role, acting as a coordinator of sorts. Shannon truly embodies operational excellence, specifically providing patients with outstanding and culturally responsive services and playing an essential role in increasing access to integrated mental health, substance use disorder, and healthcare services. I am happy to present Shannon with the Gold Award in the Health Services category. <laughs> Gold Award tie wi award winner, and there's another person, Yvette Tavera. As a medical assistant, Yvette is the integrated behavioral health star of the Watsonville team. Yeah. As the program has grown exponentially with a corresponding workload, often she is the first line of contact for patients and non-clinic employees, performing numer numerous duties outside of her medical assistant role. Due to the nature of her position, Yvette is often the recipient of, com recipient of complaints and disgruntled patients and other providers 
but her caring and compassionate attitude lead to a smooth resolution of any and all issues that come her way. Yvette ensures that all patients receive the highest quality of service while making them feel that they're the top priority of the clinic. Thank you for that. Please join me in congratulating Yvette on her accomplishment and her gold award in the health services category. Supervisor McPherson will be presenting awards in the category of human services. Uh, we don't have any uh, teams up here to, uh, to award in human services, but we have three outstanding individuals in a department of hundreds, and they're all uh, worthy of some recognition. Uh, as separate, Supervisor Leopold say, uh, said, uh, we have 2,500 employees in Santa Cruz County. Uh, they're outstanding. They, re they really do tremendous, efficient work in serving the people of Santa Cruz County. I want to thank them all. Uh, for their human services category and the bronze award, Thomas Salem. As a social worker for adult and long-term care services, Thomas is recognized as an employee that goes above and beyond when working with clients. Thomas works with uh, clients to help them overcome their fear so they may live a fuller life outside of the boundaries of their home. In doing so, Thomas exemplified dedication to community and the personalized care vulnerable adults need in order to feel supported. Fellow employees and families of those Thomas has worked with say that Thomas provides kind, professional, and warm support. Every day, Thomas demonstrates a commitment to the mission of the Human Services Department. Please join me in congratulating Thomas on his bronze award in the Human Services category. Seconds on that mic. Scott, give him 30 seconds, I'll cut it short. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear about the scarecrow that won an award? Apparently he was outstanding in his field. <laughs> scarecrow field. Uh, I'm extremely honored uh, to win the Bronze Employee Recognition Award for Excellence. I am earnestly grateful for the appreciation and recognition I have received from my work because I am very sure that every nominee for this award was as capable, if not more, of winning this award. I would like to thank my division director, Mike McConnell, my program manager, Sandy Skeezes, uh, my supervisor, Jessica Kirksina, my previous supervisor, Michelle Egan Cruz, who uh, took a shot on me and hired me, uh, Lisa Stanford, who was willing to volunteer and uh, had patience to train me. Uh, I was very, very green. I'd like to thank my coworkers for their support and friendship, especially Nor Vasquez, uh, my next door neighbor, partner in crime, uh, who helped me through my probationary period. Uh, I'd like to thank my family for putting up with me, my mommy, and God. <laughs> Dedicated to making a difference. Thank you much, very much, Thomas. Uh, the Human Services uh, Silver Award goes to Emily Simone. <laughs> Emily stepped in and filled a gap that was created when an outside vendor was no longer able to provide supervisor, supervised clinical licensing hours to employees of the family and children's services with a master's in social work. Working toward her license, at the same time, Emily really went above and beyond to provide support when it was urgently, urgently, urgent, urgently needed. Do you want to come up and speak for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, Emily, um, had, had she not stepped up, there was a risk that employees would have lost the opportunity to complete their licensing hours and the department would lose the tool for recruitment and retention of a vital s service. Emily's commitment to her department and the county is impressive as she helped to solve the extraordinary problem by providing the specialized support she was able to give. In turn, staff were able to continue to provide critical services for vulnerable youth in our community. I commend Emily for her hard work and I'm happy to present her with the Civil Award in the Human Services category. What is this, 
Well, that smile on that face would make anybody happy, so <laughs> congratulations. The Human Services Category Gold Award goes to Jessica Shiner. <laughs> Jessica has been a champion for addressing issues of homelessness in our county through Herman's, the Human Services Department supported programs. She has helped to bring the $1.3 million in state grants and design and implement housing support and homelessness prevention programs. Working with the other community stakeholders, she has also played a leadership role in helping to develop and implement Smart Path, Santa Cruz County's coordinated entry system for homeless individuals and families seeking housing support. Supporting people in need of housing is a complex yet critical issue in the county, and Jessica has been a key in developing and innovative ideas, implementing the systems that enable the department and the county to make an impact on homelessness. I am pleased to present Jessica with the Gold Award in the Human Services category. Thank you very much. Got a long way to go still oh, yeah, yeah. Supervisor Friend will now present the awards in the category of Justice. All right, we're gonna get started off with the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter, and the Bronze Award goes to Linda Puzaferro. As is normally the case of the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter, there's about a 16-page nomination form here. So Linda is a proven leader and dedicated county employee who lifts the spirits of her colleagues and supports customers at the animal shelter without fail every day. Her focus on the safety of animals and improving workflow is evident in her efforts to improve services. She regularly contributes ideas to process improvement in customer service. She consistently displays a calm, patient, and compassionate approach with everyone she comes into contact with <laughs> and has committed herself why was that funny? <laughs> <laughs> and has committed herself to a career of service with the animal shelter. Identified as a staff member who regularly makes a difference in everyone's day in a highly charged and active environment is no easy feat. It's very true. Yet you make it seem effortless. Linda exemplifies the type of employee the county seeks to recruit and retain. And I'm pleased to present Linda with the Bronze Award in the Justice category for your work in the community and for the county of Santa Cruz. Congratulations. <laughs> I just want to really thank my fellow co-workers, my boss, who is the biggest support anyone could ever have, and my lovely family for being here today. We had a very difficult decision to make yesterday when we had to take a year's dog that was abandoned on our property. Caitlin and I really struggled with it, and Linda was so kind Thank you, Linda, congratulations. So we have a two-way tie for the Silver Award. The first is shared by members of the Rehabilitation and Reentry Facility Team. Come on forward when we call your name. We've got Elizabeth Lindbergh, Paul Ramos, Kathy Sams, Travis Carey, Karen Wells, Alex Gonzalez, Sheila McDaniel, Laura Hagan, Cynthia Chase, Kurt Corum, Ryan Fisher, Brandon Skiana, Michelle Rodriguez, and Jeanette Hicks. The Rehabilitation and Reentry Facility is a newly redesigned and renovated facility with the purpose of providing rehabilitative services that target the root causes of behavior and reduces criminogenic risk factors and recidivism to enable incarcerated individuals to return to the community. By providing an array of services that include educational and vocational training, counseling, and recreation programs, the facility has a strong focus on building capacity in incarcerated individuals that supports goals of improving victim empathy, healthy, and safe communities. The team, which represents the Sheriff's Department, Public Works, and the Planning Department, exemplifies cross-sector collaboration and partnership, and I'm proud to present the Justice Silver Award to the Rehabilitation and Reentry Facility Team. Thank you for your work on that. Yes, 
sense, and he does. Very good. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. On behalf of this really dynamic team, we just want to thank um, everyone who, those who nominated us for the award, and we're so proud to be involved in a system that is focused on rehabilitation and public safety, and we're really proud of the efforts that we did together as a team. All right, it was a two-way tie, and so the other winners of the Silver Award in the Justice category are shared by the members of the Cold Case Investigations team, including Morgan Chappelle, Henry Montez, Ed Delphin, and Tom Corral. You guys so look the part. I mean, right? It's unbelievable. It's, it's like, I mean, it's good. It's good. I just. All right, so Cold Case Investigations is an integral service provided by the District Attorney's Office. In 2018, a core team of investigators worked diligently to bring the tri to trial several cold cases that resulted in closure and healing for victims and their families and ensured community safety. The team also solved several murder cases committed by one person and was able to share a confession with a victim's family to facilitate their healing process. The cold case team exemplifies strong investigative and interviewing skills, especially given the challenges of sifting through evidence and witness accounts that can be many years old. And I'm happy to present this cold case to the cold case investigative team, the silver award in the justice category. Thank you very much, Board of Supervisors, for this award. Appreciate it. Um, as you know, this is obviously a team effort, so there's other people that were very instrumental in this case. Um, and we'd like to thank them. First of all, District Attorney Jeff Rosell, Deputy DA, uh, Tara, Tara George, I'm formal Deputy DA, uh, Rob Wade were very instrumental as well, as our Chief Ken Slumbrick and our Supervisor Katrina Rogers. Thank you guys very much for giving us the tools and the support to work on these cases. As you know, some of these cases that were solved occurred over 40 years ago. Um, before my time in law enforcement, definitely before their time in law enforcement. <laughs> but yet, we still work those cases. We work those cases simultaneously while working our current cases. And we do that, and we do that for the community, the community in Santa Cruz. So just keep in mind that District Attorney's Office, Bureau of Investigation, will continue to work those cases. We are motivated for several reasons. Uh, one is for the voices that are not heard, for those people that you don't hear anymore, for their family members that always want closure. They want closure, they want justice. We'll continue to work those cases. And if there's something that we can't do today, rest assured that the inspectors of tomorrow will continue to work those cases. And as far as those that flee the country to avoid prosecution, there's no border or passage of time that's gonna stop us from going after them. We will continue to do that. We'll do that for once again, the victims, the family, and for this community that we work hard for. So thank you very much. And in the gold, for the gold award winners is shared by the members of the District Attorney's Sexual Assault Unit, including Stephen Moore, Kelly Freitas, Erica Ziegenhorn, Jason Gill, and Connor McCormick. It's kind of nice. This collaborative team in the district attorney's office has worked to refine and improve the effectiveness of the multidisciplinary interview center known as the Safe Kids and Youth or Sky Center. The Sky Center serves to ensure a safe environment for child and youth victims of sexual and physical abuse to be interviewed and is the first of its kind in this county. The team was innovative in growing the capacity of the Sky Center to include training across agencies and interviews conducted in Spanish. The team's focus on our most vulnerable population, our children, allows law enforcement agencies across the county to work together to prevent further trauma while increasing public safety. For their innovative, culturally responsive, and trauma-focused approach to serving young victims, I'm proud to present this team with the Gold Award in the Justice category. Please join me in thanking and congratulating them. Thank you. Well, we want to thank everyone, and especially the board, for this award. We'd like to thank the, the district attorney, Mr. Roselle, for the opportunity. The Sky Center has been an important addition to our county. 
Uh, it's a resource that we didn't have available before, and now we're able to serve the children of our community much better in an environment where they're much freer to talk about the kind of assaults that have happened. And so this kind of resource and this ability that our county now has is an important pickup um, and an important service that we're able to provide. On behalf of the team, I just wanna say it's an honor and a privilege, of course, working with them. It's an honor and a privilege to work for the county doing sexual assault and um, bringing those individuals who would do those kind of crimes to justice. Thank you. Supervisor Caput will now uh, present the awards in the category of land use. It's always a pleasure to uh, be a part of the award ceremony for recognizing outstanding employees. And uh, we do have, what, nearly 2,500 employees, and this is recognizing a few of them uh, that make everything work. Anyway, the uh, bronze award on land use uh, category, uh, the individual Michael Sotero, with the planning department. Michael has embraced and implemented new technology to improve the permit review process in the planning department. During 2018, Michael revamped and expanded the electronic plan check process. Uh, previously, paper plans were required for all permits which wasted paper, created manual document uh, control and added considerable cost to the applicants. The electronic plan <coughs> check process that Michael developed has addressed these issues while increasing collaboration among reviewers. Additionally, Michael developed website materials, user manuals, and how-to videos. He has really gone out of his way to assist the public with questions rego regarding electronic, electronic plan check. Uh, thank you, Michael, for your service and leadership. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to receive uh, this kind of recognition. It comes with a lot of support. The supervisors, uh, uh, my immediate supervisor, providing the flexibility and the schedule to address various kinds of things. The plan check team that I'm a part of, the increased workload that they share because of uh, my uh, shared interest in this and of course uh, the plan check uh, the rather the building counter uh, team because um, they help me uh, understand better the customer experience so i think we all work together having this bigger picture of our goal in mind and it's a shared uh, cooperation so thanks to everyone thanks jillian <laughs> keeping all this straight. Now we have the silver award, and that would be Marty Haney. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Marty is an innovative and dedicated employee who envisioned, planned, and created a comprehensive safe structure program for existing unpermitted structures to ensure they are safe, healthy, and habitable. Prior to establishment of the program, many homeowners were prohibited from obtaining county permits for maintenance and upgrades and were unable to obtain financing through conventional institutions. Marty worked to ensure that residents would be able to complete work or obtain required permits in order to apply for financing. Marty helped to protect 19 homes from the hazards associated with improper construction techniques or unsafe living condition, and several dozen additional homes are currently pending approval through the program. Due to Marty's direct involvement, residents 
were not displaced from their homes and no longer live in unsafe living. I am proud to present Marty with the silver award in the land use category. Okay, I'll say something. <laughs> um, just uh, thanks to everybody I work with. It's a great team. And uh, thanks to Juan Williams for nominating me for this. I uh, appreciate it. Anybody who's gone through uh, trying to refinance or financing uh, knows that time is money, and, uh, and we're recognizing that. Thank you. Now we go to the uh, Gold Award. Amanda Polson. Amanda is a truly exceptional employee who is highly engaged and may be found helping with and problem solving any issue in the agriculture commissioner's office, anticipating the arrival of an invasive mosquito species. We could almost make a movie maybe out of that, huh? She applied for and successfully received a grant for the Center for Disease Control which funded seasonal employees to perform surveillance. Amanda also orchestrated the design and execution of protocol for mosquito and tick surveillance and trapping and developed much of the visual information for the Agricultural Commission's uh, Earth Day booth, which won best commercial booth. Amanda epitomizes the spirit of county operational excellence and continuous process improvement through her motivational approaches. Her adoption of innovative technologies and strategies and her eagerness to move her division towards operational excellence and improved customer service. I'd like to thank and commend Amanda for her outstanding efforts and I'm happy to present this gold award on behalf of everyone here. Thank you. Um, real quick, I just wanted to say thank you to my managers, uh, Paul Binding and Juan Hidalgo for giving me the freedom and um, the trust to try new things. Um, and thanks for my awesome team of coworkers for always supporting me. Um, all the things I was uh, nominated for were things that couldn't have been done without you all. So thank you very much. What, uh, what kind of mosquito was this, by the way? The <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I just wanna take a moment again and thank uh, all the employees every day who show up and do their work. I thought it was pretty telling that everyone who spoke wanted to thank more people in their departments who they get to work collaboratively with. It's that sort of spirit uh, that makes Santa Cruz County a special place, both as an institution and as a community, and we're really grateful. We're now gonna recess until 10.40, so we can join you in the hallway, and thank you uh, over some treats. So please, uh, please join us.
<laughs> Come on. All right. I'm going to call uh, the meeting back to order and uh, move on to the next item, which is item number eight. This is a presentation by the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County regarding their Immigration Services Grant as outlined in the memo uh, that I provided. I think this is just an opportunity for uh, the board members and the community to find out about this, uh, these resources that are now available in this community so hopefully we can get uh, the word out to communities that are being very much impacted by federal policies right now. No, Thanks for that introduction. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you to Supervisor Coonerty for the invitation to uh, be here this morning and talk to you a little bit about um, some of the work that we're doing around immigration. And, oh, it's over here. I was like looking for the, the presentation. <laughs> Um, but um, I just, um, my name is Paulina Moreno. I'm one of the project directors at Community Action Board. And today I'm joined by... Um, I'm Hannah Rogers. I'm one of the assistant project directors at CAB as well. Thank you. And so we wanted to just, um, before we talk about the grant and some of the services that have, that will be a result of this grant, we wanted to um, just very briefly talk about the bigger picture around immigration. And so um, currently with CAB in alignment with the county and uh, service delivery partners, we're holding a vision to create a county-wide response strategy to support immigrants, both documented and undocumented, to thrive in our community. Um, as you all know, and I, I believe we've been here to share, that the Packard Foundation brought together a group of us um, and created the Thriving Immigrants Collaborative. Um, who were initiating and augmenting um, immigrant services based on community needs. We're a cross-sector collaborative of local organizations committed to supporting immigrant quality of life in our community. Um, and while we understand the importance and need to provide low cost to free immigration legal services, we also recognize the importance of serving a family holistically. So one of the things that we've added in terms of providing services is intense case management to some of our most vulnerable families families who are impacted by detention. We are ensuring that we are connecting them to legal services, but in addition, providing them with um, mental health support through some of our partners, ensuring that they um, have access to and completing the child care safety plan, and that they're connected to services such as food, um, transportation, or rental assistance. Um, we're thankful to the Packard Foundation, to the supervisors, and the county staff for supporting this work and our vision to develop a cross-sector plan that is responsive to the needs of the immigrant community. Um, we're working towards creating a strategic plan and uh, we're hoping to align our systems to be more responsive. Um, and so we just wanna uh, share a little bit about that and thank you um, for the opportunity to be here. And I'll just pass it over to Hannah who'll talk a little bit more about what those legal services mean. Yeah, so with this grant, which was made possible by the California Department of Social Services, uh, we were able to expand on already existing organizations in our community that have been helping um, our low-income communities and our um, immigrant communities for quite some time. But with this, we're able to expand not only into uh, North County, um, and but also expand a little bit beyond um, what legal services we're providing. So. Um, all of our um, subcontractors, all of our partners are working on education and outreach to make sure that everybody in the community knows what services we actually have, since we have quite a few. Uh, we support people in naturalization, total application process. We support uh, people renewing their DACA, so the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, we also work with other immigration remedies, so a catch-all for everything else. Um, it includes family-based petitions, um, temporary protected status, U visas, which are for people um, who are survivors or victims of uh, violent crimes who are co cooperate with law enforcement in order to um, catch the, the perpetrator. Uh, we also support people with T visas, which are uh, survivors of human trafficking. Um, adjustments of status we also do, and then um, we support people seeking um, uh, immigration remedies under the Violence Against Women Act, which is mostly around uh, domestic violence issues. Um, and these are our partners. Um, it's a 
CAB run initiative. Um, so at Community Action Board, we have the Santa Cruz Immigration, Santa Cruz County Immigration Project, um, which serves most of our residents in South County. Um, but through Community Action Board as well, we are now able through this grant to provide legal services out of the Day Worker Center, which is one of our programs um, over on 7th Avenue, so in Live Oak, as well as legal services out of the Davenport Resource Center, Resource Service Center. Um, we're also partnering with Pajaro Valley Rapid Response, which is a totally volunteer-based organization working to provide assistance and accountability for um, if there's ever any raids in our county, um, and also promoting Know Your Rights and all of that. Uh, we work with Monarch Services, which provides um, services to uh, victims, or sorry, survivors of human trafficking, domestic violence, et cetera. Uh, we also work with Community Bridges, which is another big direct service provider in the county working with our low income population. And lastly, with uh, the Community Center, sorry, SEMA, which is Community Immigration Center for Migrant Assistance. So they provide information, consultations, tutorials, and referrals for this, this same uh, population. Great. Thank you so much. Do you have anything uh, to add? Sorry, Supervisor well, Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate the uh, leadership of our chair and having you come uh, make the presentation. And I'm glad that the county was able to support it through uh, our funding uh, as well. You know, what we see at the federal level is not only a crackdown on those who are undocumented, but even those who are here legally, who are going through the process. And so having advocates uh, like yourself who are partnering with others to be able to support uh, people in our community who are, are faced with lots of difficult questions about, uh, to be able to participate, uh, be here, provide for their families um, is in critically important. And I just want to recognize you for your work and thank you for the presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's just, I think it's really important we get the word out to let people know um, that one level of government's policies is not reflective of all, uh, all of our policies and that our values are very different and we want to help people um, be in this community, work in this community, be with their families in the community. Um, and this is a, a really big opportunity through uh, CAB's leadership uh, to provide those services and I just want to appreciate your efforts. So thank you so much. Oh, sorry, Supervisor Caput. You bet. <coughs> well, congratulations on uh, exactly about how much money are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about almost oh, $731,000, which translate to approximately over, a little bit over 3,000 people that we can now expand services to in our county. That's great. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, <coughs> I, I make this comment. Uh, we can go back all the way to maybe even the Clinton administration, uh, then uh, Bush, and then uh, Obama, and now. Mm -hmm. uh, what, I, what I can understand, I have friends that are Democrat, Republican, Independent. I don't know any of them that are against uh, the Dreamers, the mm -hmm. DACA program, and why this has taken so long that it, uh, it, should, be a, it should be a slam dunk where they, uh, they make the people that came here when they were kids, some have gone to elementary school, junior high school, high school, and then they're okay. going to college and they still yeah, so don't have uh, legal status. Right. Uh, so how is that going uh, as far as uh, helping them out? Well, we continue to work with, um, part of our effort is to do a lot of the education and outreach and working directly with the schools. Um, we provide trainings for some of the counselors. We also work directly with um, some of the students that are both, you know, dreamers, but are also advocates of, of dreamers to ensure that, um, luckily in California, we have access to, um, things beyond um, what other states have. So for example, in California, we wanna make sure that students recognize that we have the California Dream Act and they can apply for um, scholarships if they want to continue to higher education. Um, and so we're actively um, making sure that people understand um, what are the different paths, but we're also working to um, write letters to our legislators about in support of um, allowing the DACA program to reopen again. We have a lot of eligible um, young kids that are just turned um, 15 that would potentially benefit from DACA had, had we allowed it to, to continue. 
You bet. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how much uh, will this help out uh, the immigration uh, uh, legal advice uh, that comes through, I guess, Doug Keegan and mm -hmm. uh, through the office in South County, and I'm glad to see it expanded. So, uh, yeah, how, how is that going to help? Well, um, we've been able to expand uh, our hours, so uh, that, that has been one key element. We have been able to hire additional staff. Um, now, uh, we went through an entire accreditation process through the Department of Justice to be able to provide immigration services out of the Day Worker Center, then Davenport Resource Service Center. And so, um, it potentially allows us to have a bigger reach and for people to understand that they have a trusted organization that they can go to um, for referrals, for consultations. Um, one of our biggest obstacles is um, in fighting the, the folks who are claiming that they can help someone um, through their immigration process. And so we want to make sure that people know where to go to, where to ask for um, help. And luckily now we have a whole network of partners that are helping us get the word out and all you um, the supervisors and community for allowing us to be here and share that information so that people know where to go to. I, th I think uh, you mentioned it right there uh, what's so important about the uh, immigration legal advice that they get. <coughs> uh, some people, and they still are, uh, they get a promise from a lawyer that's referred to them by a, a friend or whatever, and they spend thousands of dollars right. and they get nothing mm -hmm. uh, because they are undocumented and they feel like they're afraid to go to court to get their money back or whatever. Are they able to get their money back or are they lost it uh, if they go to some of these, uh, in, um, you know? Well, I know um, through, uh, it, through the Immigration Project and I know through the Watson the Law uh, Center, um, there's a way to actually be able to report folks. Unfortunately, oftentimes, um, I don't know the status of what those cases look like if people are able to um, get their money back. So I don't know the answer to that. I could get back to you <laughs> on that. But I know that there are ways um, for us, and we need those voices. We need to know, because unless we know and people tell us about fraudulent um, organizations, or, or, or so-called notarios who claim to be attorneys, um, then it's very difficult for us to know and, and advocate for them. And uh, getting the word out mm -hmm. that people know that they can go somewhere and uh, uh, not to be taken advantage of uh, monetarily. Uh, so uh, how will you do that? Will you add to the outreach, out, uh, add to the advertising? Or yeah, whatever? you want to speak on that? You want me to? Yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do with uh, uh, with yeah. this grant money. Um, as I mentioned, every single partner here is tasked with deliverables around education and outreach primarily, and then there's a few that deal specifically with legal services. Are you wanting an answer about strategy or? Sure. Why don't, well, I think, why don't we save that and that you can get back to Supervisor Caput um, as it goes forward, because uh, the, the, the purpose of this was really just to give a broad overview of this program, let the community know it's out there, then each of us can go and reach out to communities in our heart. And, I'll and just, quick, I'll wrap sure. it up here, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, really important to go out to the mm -hmm. labor camps and uh, uh, talk to them. This is quickly related to both the legal process and also Monarch Services, is that for the uh, violence against women? Okay, uh, because we've heard in the past uh, some women uh, don't want to report, uh, maybe they're being abused uh, terribly, uh, right. but uh, they're afraid if their uh, spouse or whatever, a husband or a boyfriend gets uh, uh, deported, they don't want to go forward and, uh, you know, then they, they, they are losing their income or whatever. So. How are we going to help out Monarch and help out through that process real quick? Yeah, so definitely, we're. Um, uh, this is only one component of, you know, we wanted to make sure people understood about the, the services, but we're um, part of a broader uh, network of immigration collaborative where, in fact, we have the our local police department involved. So in order to help us think about what are the types of messages that we need to get across to the community where people feel safe to report crimes, um, not just um, about domestic violence, which is uh, hugely unreported, but also feel safe to report other crimes. Um, and so we're in the process of part of our strategic plan and coming together um, uh, with cross
cross-sector agencies and um, grassroots organizers is to address some of those uh, key challenges. And so I, I'd, I'd be happy to give you more information about that, definitely. And quickly, mm -hmm. if you could just uh, remark on Pajaro Valley uh, rapid response, mm -hmm. what is that? So um, after, soon after the election, there were um, several uh, counties, cities that developed their rapid response networks in response to um, increased immigration uh, ICE presence in their communities. And so one of those efforts led, there's a, there's a Northern California, North, North County um, rapid response network as well, and then there's a South County one as well. I don't know if, you, if in the community you all seen the red cards. There's a number that people can call that um, someone will answer no matter what day, uh, what time or of the day they call, and they can get more information and referrals in terms of um, immigration legal services. Um, we're working with uh, PVRR to do Know Your Rights presentations, to train people to be legal observers and document um, cases of um, ab abuse. Mm -hmm. you bet. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Coonerty. I could go on for hours yeah. <laughs> actually asking questions, but uh, you're one of my favorite programs because you're helping out uh, people that really need uh, assistance right now. Thank you. Well, we thank you all for your support. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're now moving on to item number nine. This is to consider a proposed ordinance amending Chapter 7.130, Cannabis Dispensaries of Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz County Code, place an ordinance on the next available agenda for final adoption, schedule a hearing on uh, March 26, 2019, beginning at 9 a.m. or thereafter to consider proposed amendments to the unified fee schedule related to cannabis licensing fees and direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of the hearing as outlined in the memo of the CAO. Um, and I should note, uh, I plan on hearing item number nine and item number 10.2 um, right after this since they're in the same, uh, of the same subject matter and then we'll get on to item number uh, 9.1. Thank you. Um, the proposed amendments to Santa Cruz County Code 7.130, the Cannabis Dispensary Ordinance, are updates to reflect uh, the current state of the retail cannabis industry. Since the original passage of 7.130 in June 2016, the state has proposed, or the state has developed uh, regulations for medical and adult use retail, uh oh, sorry. Um, uh, retail cannabis businesses. The proposed amendments to Chapter 7.130 are intended to improve clarity, remove language that's no longer relevant to our local industry, and improve the county's operational insight to retailers through the license renewal process by requiring retailers to submit additional data required by the state. Um, the modifications to the code include removal of local advertising restrictions. Prior to this meeting, the Cannabis Licensing Office has worked with various stakeholder groups, including the community prevention partners. Um, through this outreach and review of the state regulations, uh, staff believe the current state regulations adequately address youth prevention through restricted advertisement, marketing, and signage. Um, and additionally, various out-of-jurisdiction cannabis companies are following the state guidelines and advertising their products locally. These advertisements are in violation of our current ordinance, but the county has no enforcement authority as the advertisements are being made by companies out of our jurisdictional area. And this has led to confusion among businesses and the public. <clears throat> it's problematic to enforce and is create an uneven playing field for our local retailers. The state regulations address advertising and marketing, and these regulations include um, displays of advertising and marketing materials uh, may only be displayed after a state licensee has obtained up-to-date audience composition data, demonstrating at least 71.6% of the audience is 21 or older. Um, they cannot display uh, minors in depictions or images, and they cannot include images designed to be appealing to, mi uh, to minors. So, there you go. Great. Any other questions? Uh, any questions by board members? Supervisor Friend. So I, have, I just have a couple of brief questions regarding uh, the advertising. We, we did get a letter from the community uh, prevention partners in regards to billboards that struck me as pretty uh, reasonable. Um, so if we make this change, you said that it's not enforceable in essence now. Does that mean we're going to actually be making any kind of enforcement on people that are in violation of what the state slash county ordinance would be moving forward? Um, 
we've currently been enforcing the county ordinance and we will continue to enforce the ordinance uh, which does include a catch-all for any issues associated with Malcursa. So if there are advertising um, in violation of uh, state law, they will be subject to county enforcement measures if they're within our local jurisdiction. Would it be safe to characterize the state law as uh, weaker than the county's current <coughs> ordinance? It is, I wouldn't classify it as weaker because there is stronger audience data composition and um, as discussed with uh, community prevention partners, uh, the majority of this advertising is occurring in the good times, which um, has the audience composition requirements um, that the state has. Can I ask why signage was included in addition to advertising since they're distinct elements, why we would also try and toss in the signage change? Uh, um, the state law covers advertising and marketing, which includes the signage requirements. So no displays of cannabis goods or anything that could be conceived as cannabis related um, would effectively be permissible under state law on the exterior of a building such as signage. Um, as such, if a company were to proceed down that path, they would be in direct violation of state law and under our enforcement authority. And by violating Mount Cursa in any way, um, any retailer at that point faces uh, the potential for license revocation. So it's a serious consequence to violate um, any part of state law and we have been, had, an, had a fairly robust enforcement mechanism, I believe in the past few months. So the, thanks for that. So the county, I mean, we had a pretty robust discussion at the board about advertising and signage at the beginning of this process, and we wanted to, to be uh, as restrictive as possible to ensure that, that it wasn't from a visual standpoint, uh, in essence, youth didn't see it as well. So can you tell me what, with this signage change, what I might see differently at a dispensary? If I was driving down Soquel, for example, in my district where there's a dispensary, currently they're allowed to have, in essence, a green cross with an open sign and really nothing else under our current uh, construct, what would change or what would be permissible to be changed? Uh, they wouldn't be able to display any cannabis or cannabis goods on the exterior of the building in any way because they wouldn't have adequate um, composition data to say that they were at their advertising marketing <laughs> signage was 71.6% or greater than um, for folks greater than 21. So those displays would not be in any way allowed. Um, the Green Cross effectively uh, doesn't have any direct cannabis associated with it. You know, it, it's a sign of the industry and could effectively be roped into the regulations if you looked at it very tightly. Um, that would be, there'd probably be some discretion about allowing the Green Crosses to still be there. So I'm not concerned with the current construct, I'm concerned about what's possible with changing the construct, right? Yeah. So, so what, I, what I'm concerned about is, I, I just want to know what it is I'm voting on in this regard. Will allowing a signage change mean that I'm going to see things fundamentally different at dispensaries driving through the county than what I currently see? Uh, it's the signage component that, I, that has me hung up on the changes of this ordinance. I'm actually not even... I, I can make an argument, I'm not even sure why majority of these things are even coming to the board. I didn't know how necessary some of them were. Some of them are cleanup, that's reasonable, uh, but some of them uh, on the advertising and signage, I wasn't fully there on the signage. I'm definitely not there unless I can be convinced that there isn't going to be a fundamental shift uh, for people in our community and what they're going to see on the outside. So maybe I could, I could help Jason Heath from County Council's office. Um, the. Uh, the, the signage and the advertising is a different issue. And, and I think that a, a compromise, a clean compromise position could be to leave the signage regulation as it is and go with the state law on the advertising. It is, um, it's hard for me to argue that to remove the language in its entirety is not weakening it because we are taking what is direct language in the code now and substituting it with something that is more broad under state law. That doesn't mean that we can't enforce the broad language under state law, and I think that's what, what, um, what Mr. Laforte is, is trying to communicate, is that we still have all of our enforcement mechanisms available, it's just that we're not enforcing local law anymore, we're enforcing state law. But if, you, if, if the board wanted to keep the signage restrictions in place, it's possible to do that. We could come back in a couple of weeks with something 
uh, that on that subsection 11 on the advertising piece where we've taken everything out down to uh, uh, the signage regulations, that they have to comply with the signage regulations, we could say, state in there that the signage reg the, the included in the signage regulations that one cannot use cannabis imagery, you know, detail, pricing, structure, something like that. I appreciate that. It's because to me, that, that's always been the intent of the board. One of my concerns has been is that we've been through a lot on these ordinances, from dispensing to cultivation to manufacturing to taxation, and it's sort of, and I recognize it's an evolutionary process, and we'd always committed that it would be an evolutionary process. But I don't want a sort of these episodic, one-off weakening of ordinances along the way. Even if the state uh, has made changes, we had fought for local control on everything, on all of these elements to do what was best for our community. So I have concerns about what the sort of, what I don't want is to weaken it, find out it's an issue, and then come back to have to strengthen it. We, we failed on that on cultivation. So how do we ensure that we're not doing that is what, what my concerns are. They seem like, th like they might be minor changes, but they might actually not be minor changes, and that's where I'm at with that. I, what I want is also an insurance, it sounds like we're getting an insurance that there will actually be enforcement. I don't think that's been the case uh, in regards to some of this, some elements of the ordinance. So if, if this cleanup on the, or adhering to the state component, uh, means that there would be uh, something more clear and more enforceable, then that's actually uh, good as far as the advertising goes. But uh, I, I, I think that, that the compromise, so to speak, that you present on the signage, because I felt like that was the board's intent all along, uh, makes more sense to me, which is having something very clear about what is permitted or isn't permitted on signage throughout the county on that element. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, um, I think the, the, the questions you ask are good. Uh, because we did have concerns about signage right from the get-go on, <coughs> on, uh, on retail establishments. We needed to have those in part because there were no state regulations. I mean, we were operating, <coughs> we were operating in a system in which there was no, the regulatory environment was uh, non-existent except what we created. Um, and so as the state has developed a regulatory infrastructure, um, it becomes a lot more clear what it is you can and cannot do. And I don't think you actually answered the question as to what would signage be look like. Because I, I share the concerns, right? We don't want cartoon characters and big leafs and, 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 and pictures. Uh, but the way I read this, is this is gonna be about the size of signs and everything. The state law would still prevent all those things from happening. It, 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 it literally would. It, <coughs> it, it, the sign, to answer the question directly, the signs should look no different than they are today. And if they look different than they do today, then they can be enforced against. But what we're enforcing against is state law, not something that's very specific in local law that we can point to that says, you're violating 7.130 subsection 11. Instead, what we would be doing is we'd be asking them a question. Um, for instance, uh, do you have data to demonstrate that your signs are only viewable by adults up to 71.2%? And if you, don't, if you don't have that data, then we're gonna cite you. You know, so that's, that's kind of, the short answer to your question is the signs, the, the actual billboards and the signs outside should look no different from a content perspective than they do today. Yep, and, and, and uh, I think that's important. And, and I respect the, the I interest of both my colleague and potentially members of the public who think that we need to uh, uh, replicate pieces of state law in our local ordinances. You know, that's, uh, uh, I get that. Um, I wouldn't stand in the way of that, but this is, now that we have a state regulatory framework, there is clear rules uh, about this and other pieces around advertising and um, make, having ours sync up with them makes perfect sense and whether we need to have something additional to them, if, if it's not being addressed by the state regulations, that's what I think would be helpful, the most helpful in our ordinance. And I'm not, I'm not sure that there's anything that we're looking to do that'd be more restrictive than the state. We just want to, it, it sounds like the interest is reinforcing what, the, what's in the, what, we, what we've always talked about. It, but additionally, it, it sounds 
let's think about this from an enforcement standpoint. <clears throat> to me, it strikes me as a lot easier to just say that's in violation of a county code. It's cut and dry and it's clear than to have to create an additional step for county staff that already doesn't have any basically enforcement staff really dedicated to this, at least so I constantly hear there isn't enough, to say, can you demonstrate that you're not in violation of state law? That's a, in essence, it's a, an additional proactive step that seems unnecessary if we had a code that was already addressing it. So I, I just wanna, while, while maybe the end result is ultimately the same, the mechanism to get there isn't, um, and is there an advantage or any advantage to the county having an additional tool to a violation of a county ordinance on top of what the state regs are uh, for anything else that we happen to do moving forward on renewal of licenses or whatever it may be from a local standpoint? Um, so our county code actually has a catch-all for enforcement of um, all aspects of Mount Cursa, the state law. So that is what we will cite people for if there is an advertising um, violation of any kind. And we've utilized that catch-all to increase the compliance aspects that we're currently looking at for all licensees, not just retailers within the county. Um, those, those compliance inspections are occurring regularly uh, right now, and our code enforcement staff, uh, in addition to uh, public input, have been very active in enforcement. We've received um, three complaints total for advertising uh, since I've been here in December. Um, two of the complaints were from community prevention partners, and all three of the enforcement actions that took place based on those complaints were done before either of the complaints from community prevention partners were issued. So we have been proactive and we have been issuing enforcement or utilizing our enforcement tools um, as appropriately and as quickly as possible. And if, if state law were to change and to weaken on this component, say they allowed cartoon advertising, um, but we're now adhering to state law, how is that so we would, our interest? Yeah, we would have a lot of lead time on that because they have to go through the regulatory process of the state. We would be aware of what they were doing. Um, uh, he has the time, Sam has the timelines on it, but, but, but we would have plenty of time to bring your board something put in place something more restrictive. One of the tensions that we're, we're trying to deal with here, and it actually kind of dovetails with a later item on your agenda today, is, is the redundancy of, of putting state law in the county code. And one of the problems with doing that is that uh, time goes by, the laws change, we don't keep up with things, uh, and, uh, and then we have conflicts going on in between the, uh, the state law and the county code. I, I, the tension on the other side is what you're bringing up, Supervisor, of trying to be very specific with what the community standards are with regard to this and not having to force someone to go to state law to look it up to figure it out. Um, you know, your board is the one who's gonna have to, you know, suss through those things, but I, you, both of the points that you're raising are well taken. Um, I, I've had an sure. additional question. So we're, we're we have uh, dispensaries that are now going through the renewal process. Um, and so this is one of the things that you look at. We, we have an annual renewal process for dispensary license. And, and we can deny for um, violations of signage, you know, right then and there, right? That's an annual process that we yes. have going on. Okay, thank you. Ha have we had any problems with signage in any of the renewal processes so far? Uh, we had three uh, violations of signage requirements last year that were remedied immediately um, by all of the current licensees. Um, and we've had one violation of signage from a non-retail facility that was also um, remedied immediately, but there were uh, notice of violations issued, so there's permanent record of those and we keep them in our paper files and within our electronic reporting system. Okay, thank you. Supervisor McPherson? I, I agree with the concern. I mean, uh, at this whole subject matter that we've been talking about for three years, one of the, the, the key phrases is as much local control, local control as we can have. And um, I think if we can strengthen that, it seems as has been suggested by Supervisor Friend, I, I'd, I'd be supportive of that. Um, but um, like you said, I don't want to get it intermixed with 
state, you know, so much that it's just confusing. Every time they change something, we have to react. Um, I just, I'm trying to figure out the best avenue to do that, to make a change now or suggest something. Uh, I'm not sure what Supervisor Friend might have in mind, but uh, I'm just concerned about that. Are you asking that question? Yes. What, what, okay, the, 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 the answer to that question is, is, is you would be to ask, ask staff to come back at your next board meeting with some revisions to the advertising language, taking into account what your board has mentioned uh, with regard to signage. If you come up with a motion that, that is voted on successfully that includes revision of the signage restrictions, then we would bring this whole package back on the 26th and ask uh, and recommend language at that time. Supervisor Caput. You've answered almost all the questions that I had. Uh, the, the concern I had was uh, uh, the future of the state changing this or becoming more uh, accepting of, you know, bigger signs and all that. Uh, <clears throat> kind of like, it's a, you know, like, we're, we're only talking about dispensaries and we're not talking about cultivators and, you know, out in the field. We're talking about all commercial cannabis businesses. I mean, I mean, there are different restrictions on state law that, that the state law has, but I mean, it, within this discussion, we're not just talking about retailers, we're talking about all commercial cannabis businesses. Okay, so when uh, a cultivator, you know, let's say I'm driving uh, uh, by strawberry fields or whatever, and you know, you've seen some of those signs where they have a couple of farmers standing out by a tractor and it's a big cutout, uh, is, is, that, is that allowed? in uh, state law that would not, with cannabis that would not be allowed if it's a uh, sign directly there are there are separate signs for billboards which we in the county only have two billboards i believe um, one on highway 17 and one in the watsonville area uh, but if somebody be, puts a big cannabis leaf up on a yeah. on a farm that's going to be enforced against yeah yeah, that, that would not be allowed by state law and that would not be allowed within our county code. And to elaborate on changes to state law, the state has to follow the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, where they issue the proposed regulation. That regulation is out for a 45-day public comment period, at which time they address the public comments. Uh, once it's finalized, it goes to the office of OAL, where the um, Office of Administrative Law has 30 days to review and, and publicize it. Now, in that time period, I think the county moves much more nimbly and can address any potential changes rapidly that way. And there's no uh, assembly bill or senate bill, kind of like uh, AB 286 that is changing one thing, but there's not something pending that would change the uh, state law for advertising. Nothing at this time. At this time. And then the only uh, other thing would be, uh, what, what is Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Clara doing? Are they uh, conforming just to state law? Or are we the only one that has more you know, restrictive uh, rules? For Monterey and San Benito, I believe they are utilizing state law. I can't speak to the other um, regulatory bodies. Okay. Okay. Chair. Uh, no, yeah. uh, just, just a clarification question. Uh, Mr. Heath uh, uh, mentioned all cannabis business, but this regulation is for the cannabis dispensary license. That's, That's what right. we're all talking about it today. It is. That's correct. Right. That's correct. We, we're, we, it's, it's correct that, to, that we're talking about cannabis businesses. The discussion got a little broader because we were discussing a lot of hypotheticals about generally advertising uh, versus signage mm -hmm. and the like. So it strayed a little bit. And, and uh, I appreciate that. And And just to be clear, adding in or keep, let's say keeping what we have in our regulations now or adding the language from the state um, regulations does not make our ordinance stronger it just makes it it, it makes it more clear right i mean there's nothing that's there's no additional power to adding that that language in there other than making it as clear as possible that's a fair statement okay thank you okay now we'll open it up to the public uh, any members of the public like to speak to us about this item, please come forward. Good afternoon. Khalil Mutawakil with Kind Peoples. I missed you all. <laughs> it's been far too long. Um, I'll read a prepared statement I have here. 
I, I do thank and commend the pragmatism uh, from our board and the Cannabis Licensing Office, as well as the Administrative Office and the CPP, who's here today. Uh, after more than five years of operation, I'm still proud to be in business, and, and I'm proud of this board for taking strong measures to both allow and sensibly regulate the cannabis dispensaries. I strongly support local control when possible, but we also must remember that we are now operating in a statewide marketplace and we want consistency with our competition. In order to have an equal playing field, we must leverage new California law and state enforcement dollars wherever possible. The state has more funding and economies of scale to regulate our industry, thus relieving strain at the local level. And while dispensaries are imperfect, we have very little beyond the state regulations that require an additional layer of local complexity. Perhaps signage is one of them. I would not argue with that. Thank you, Supervisors Coonerty and Leopold, for the letter supporting state uh, excise tax reduction. The arguments to do so are extremely relevant for both reducing taxes at the state and the local level right here at home. For nearly five years, county retailers have funded the formation of the Cannabis Licensing Department and the ability to tax and regulate the local supply chain. The Santa Cruz County retail market has drastically shifted since the tax's inception. State licenses alone are $100,000 annually for our single location in the county. County tax collections are roughly flat since 2015. The legal market is not winning, it is not growing. State and local, local taxes are crushing our industry. Let's please look to our communities that do have it right. In Monterey, retailers pay 4% of gross sales. Oakland slashed their tax rate in half last year. Santa Rosa's retail tax rate is 3%. And in San Francisco, the tax will not take effect at all until 2021 to give the industry the opportunity to grow. And now, more challenges lie ahead. As five more retailers open in the city of Santa Cruz and Capitola, that's in total, while a new state law allows any out-of-county business to make customer deliveries into Santa Cruz. So thank you for the continued support to modernize our ordinance, but 2019 is the year that an oversaturation of retailers and overtaxation will have irreversible effects on our local businesses that cannot be undone. So please consider taking action soon with respect to taxation, as the City of Santa Cruz will be meeting next month to reevaluate their tax strategies. So in summary, I think we have a very reasonable and cohesive ordinance supporting the highest per capita density of retailers in the state here in Santa Cruz. And while I'm grateful for the progress we've made, we must consider taxation and carefully consider any future changes that may further disrupt the ecosystem of our strong local marketplace. Thank you. Uh, good morning, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jenna Shankman and I'm here representing Community Prevention Partners as was discussed before. So um, thanks to the letter, a lot of the points were already brought up, but just to kind of reinforce a couple of things. Um, so Community Pre Prevention Partners has continuously advised the inclusion of local advertising restrictions to prevent a proliferation of cannabis advertising to youth who research show are especially susceptible to marketing. Um, at a February 28th um, CPP Cannabis Initiative meeting, members met and discussed what is working and what is not working with cannabis advertising um, with the cannabis licensing average, um, um, manager there. Given the increase in state advertising regulations that disallows cannabis design um, in any manner likely to be appealing to minors or anyone under 20 years of, 21 years of age with specific examples um, for I believe the first time, uh, including toys, inflatables, movie characters, and cartoons, and that there is um, an age threshold for the audience of 71.6% over um, 21, the group assessed that there was a lot of protections um, at the state level but specifically in that current iteration of state advertising regulations, and we kind of left it off with the caveat that this alignment um, was something that we um, felt comfortable with as long as the strong state advertising language was specifically named and protected in our ordinance. For instance, um, one possibility we're wondering about is through reference to the state code with the date. Um, so having some sort of prevention of cannabis advertising to youth embedded in local policy is very important to community prevention partners based on past experience and research on alcohol and tobacco advertising's impact on youth. Uh, really a lot of that research has linked to um, that influence on behavior and we feel like there's a really uh, rich um, opportunity here to do something different and we know 
that with alcohol, there was a lot of lobbying pressures um, that lessened um, those restrictions of the state over time. And additionally, local control has really been a core tenet of youth substance use prevention um, to allow greater monitoring and enforcement, although I know that you know that's something being worked on by the licensing office. Um, and one other area where um, we mentioned that we would um, diverge from the state slightly is having a clear ban on cannabis advertising billboards. Um, as mentioned, um, there's two billboards, but we want to be diligent to prevent cannabis advertising from being prominently visible to youth at both gateways of our community on Highway 17 and in South County. Um, and then I don't know if this is the item for now, and we haven't had an opportunity to talk about it specifically, but I know something about the, the equity program is coming up, and that is something that individual members um, have discussed um, previously, and equity is one of our core kind of guiding principles that we do this coalition work for. So um, yes, thank you for your time. Hi, Jim Coppas from Ben Lomond, uh, Green Trade. I want to thank uh, the Cannabis Licensing Office for uh, staying on top of these regulations. And, and as Supervisor Friend said, it is evolutionary. It, uh, it's happening at warp speed at the state. And uh, we need to make sure that we keep up. And so I appreciate the attention to the uh, trying to clarify the language in the local ordinance. Uh, Green Trade is also a, a partner of the Community uh, Prevention Partners Group, and um, we, sprung, we, we are uh, very careful to align ourselves with their positions, and we do so in this regard, uh, uh, with regards to advertising. We think it's important that there be uh, local control over uh, what kinds of advertisements uh, uh, cannabis businesses can uh, have, and we think it's important that uh, that language be reflected in the ordinance. Finally, I think because this, uh, much of the changes to this ordinance uh, dealt with clarity, one thing that uh, is a personal peeve of mine, and I was appreciative to hear uh, Sam speak to it obliquely, which is that the, we, this ordinance is really about retail sales, and the use of the word dispensary is kind of arcane, and uh, perhaps at the next iteration you could take a look at uh, bringing this uh, language into the uh, uh, 2020 uh, era. So thank you. Hi, uh, Pat Malo. Um, first, I want to thank all you guys for dealing with this issue yet again, and I want to thank uh, Sam for you know bringing these issues up to you guys. And I think that um, there's, although it might be painful, there's a lot of tweaks we need to make, a lot of large changes we might need to make, and so this start with kind of aligning with the state on these issues I think is a really good idea, mostly because we want our local businesses to be able to survive and to put, not put them at a competitive disadvantage with the rest of the state I think is essential. Um, also as a CPP member, I do agree and the discussion that we had at the last meeting was that CPP saw this parity issue as that we need to you know let local businesses compete equally, um, but that also we wanted to retain the local control and if we thought at this moment that the state had adequate prevention um, you know, measures in, that we would want to lock that into our local ordinance by mirroring the state just in case the state changes things and the 45-day window is not enough time for us to act, that we still have stuff in place. And I thought that was a, a good compromise position with still accomplishing that you know, parity at state level that we need. Um, and just in general, I think that you know, all of you are becoming aware that you know, for this, you know, this moment in time at cannabis is very critical if we want to retain local businesses, if we want to retain local ownership of those businesses, and most importantly, if we want to give this experiment called regulated cannabis a chance to outcompete the traditional unregulated system, um, I think that we really need to be light on our feet. And so thank you, Sam, for bringing this stuff up. I think there's a lot of other changes in 7.128 we need to get to, um, but this is a good first start, so thank you guys. 
Hello, my name is Valerie Corral, and I want to echo uh, what you've heard here from my constituents, my partners in uh, in this process. And um, you know, when we all began in a vacuum t many decades ago, and it lead it often leads to revisiting legislation. We didn't really know what that broad stroke would be, so we made something incredible happen in this community. And it's difficult to look back on uh, revisiting and revisiting the same things, but social change requires that, because in the beginning, it is not the way that people think, it is not normal. But now, this is a new kind of normalcy. So we have to look at it and revisit it, and we have to open our the possibilities for us to have input and to look at the way that it's coming about. The competition is fierce, and it's not only the alcohol lobbyists that we're facing. We're facing investors that with huge money that, I mean, it's called Canadian money. I have no idea really what that means. Uh, if you follow the money, though, as I've been doing at some of the people who've come to ask to invest in WAM, which is not possible to do, the money is often linked to pharmaceutical companies. It's linked to um, alcohol, it's linked to tobacco, in nefarious ways, but it has li these links and these ties, and that is really who we're up against. So if we cannot afford to pay the taxes, and if we cannot afford the fees, if we cannot afford to stay in business as small business people in this community, I'm afraid that you'll be looking at partners in your own community that are not really your neighbors, and, not, and really don't have the best interest of this town and this county and our small community at heart. So I know it's a pain and we'll probably be back here asking you for a lot more things and really appreciate that you've given us the time and also the input because I know that it's a lot of work. You can always ask me for anything that I, way that I can help, but you guys are more adept at that lawmaking stuff, so I'll just keep pushing. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. So that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the uh, board for action. Real quick. Uh, go. I'll, I'll try to construct a motion here and you can let me know if it uh, meets the needs. So I'll move the recommended actions with additional direction for staff to return at our next board meeting with modifications that include a ban on billboard advertising and maintaining local control over signage restrictions as exists in the current ordinance. I'll second that. Okay, we got a motion and a second, Supervisor Leopold. Um, I, I support the motion, um, and uh, but uh, I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, maybe council knows um, there are restrictions I think in place over tobacco advertising uh, with uh, with cartoon characters and everything else. Are you are you aware of that? I'm mildly aware of yeah. it. Yeah, I, mean, uh, uh, I don't think that's reflected in our tobacco ordinance. Right, I mean, th th so I, th I make that point um, because uh, we, are, we are just trying to highlight th uh, these issues, but we aren't actually making the ordinance uh, stronger. We're just saying these are important enough to us. And I, I understand the, the value in that. Uh, 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 banning it from billboards, I think that's a, that's a great idea. Um, and I, I appreciate that we're, that uh, over time we're gonna be looking at our ordinances just like we have another item on here about something non-cannabis related but also looking at our ordinances. It's healthy for us to t take a look at things every once in a while and see whether they match up with state law, whether there are items that w were important at one time but no longer as important, or things that we wanna highlight as part of, the, uh, uh, of our own uh, ordinances. Uh, but uh, I think that given the, given the changing nature of some regulations around uh, this particular area, around cannabis, these will come back to us on a regular basis. And y I think you've done an admirable job of trying to give us a, a cleanup ordinance. And we're giving you direction um, that recognizes that effort and just t trying to highlight those things that are important. Can, can I ask for clarification on the motion? Uh, the motion was to accept staff recommendation, which would be to adopt this ordinance on first read. Uh, and then that, that means uh, it will be on for March 26th as full adoption. Are you wanting us to come back with another revision to that one section or are you asking us to 
are you basically wanting us to postpone adoption of the complete package until we line it up with the signage regulations that you're talking about? So let me say this, the current ordinance, if I didn't modify it, already has the signage component. So if it was stricken from what you're, not what you're recommending, but what's in the staff recommendation, to me, I don't consider that a, a change that requires another reading of the ordinance that's maintaining the ordinance as is. So uh, to me, I, the only addition would be the ban on billboard advertising. Yeah, I, I, have to, I have to make some substantive changes that would require re um, re-noticing of those provisions. So the two options that we have are either to accept staff recommendation completely today with, with the additional direction that your board wants us to come back on the 26th with an additional ordinance, and that additional ordinance okay. would just address this one item, or number okay. two. Okay, you've got I, I understand, so okay. then, then it, it wouldn't be the motion would be incorrect to make it for the recommended actions. Okay. Okay, so then help guide me through what I'm trying to do. Which is, I mean, everybody in the room knows what I'm trying to do. So we're, yeah. we're, we're the, 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 we want to hear this, and I guess anew on the 26, correct? With these, with these, with the direction that the uh, that the board's making on these two elements. Yeah. If if I under, if I understand what you're what you're asking us to do is, um, the motion would be to not accept staff's recommendation with regard to the ordinance. Because remember, there are two things here. We're also asking you to notice a public hearing right. for, so we'll get to that in a second. But um, we request that you, that you adopt staff's recommendation to set the public hearing on the unified fee schedule changes for March 26. But with regard to the ordinance, have staff return to address the, not the advertising, but the signage billboard issue that your board has discussed today. Okay, so, so I believe my motion then will be to accept items three and four of the recommended actions. Uh, and to come back on March 26th with changes to uh, item one, which is the attached ordinance in regards to signage and the ban on billboards and to schedule the first reading of that ordinance on March 26th. Item one is also chapter 7.130. Yeah. Of the recommended actions. I, th I think I understand it correctly. Uh, <coughs> so we're, we're, ex we're, we're accepting some, but not. Yeah, what you're, what, you're, what you're accepting today is just the staff recommendation on uh, setting the public hearing for the unified fee schedule changes on March 26th. And essentially you're asking us to return with Exhibit A, again, you're not, you're not adopting Exhibit A today, yeah. okay. the ordinance. You're asking us to come back with some changes to, I think it's packet page 45, I believe it is, that, uh, that references the signage regulations. So and as we'll a point of clarification, best. I'll withdraw sure. my original motion. Okay. And I would like to introduce a substitute motion to that original motion that has uh, item, accepts the recommended actions of item three and four, which is the schedule of public hearing on the U unified fee schedule as well as directing the directing the clerk of when to schedule set or to notice it. And to, on items one and two, which is regarding chapter 1.7.130, uh, to come back on March 26th which, with the inclusion of the billboard uh, ban and the signage changes that we discussed today. Uh, I'm okay with the second on that and real quick. <coughs> so uh, there's more than just advertising in uh, chapter 7.130, right? We have we're going to conform with the um, employees consumption of uh, cannabis yes that's right we're going to we're going to bring those changes back on march 26 okay. so your board can ad can can review them as one package sure so not to comp so we have a motion and a second uh, motion by friend second by uh, caput um, <coughs> it seems to me that that we have broad agreement on this advertising and that we have this very small mm -hmm. billboard issue that is essentially non-existent. So do we, do we have to hold up everything in order to fix this billboard and signage issue, which well, is that was, that the was, tail wagging the dog? That was the option two that, that, that I didn't get to because Supervisor Friend understood, but the option two would be to go ahead and accept staff recommendation to, to, to change the ordinance, but instruct us to come back with an additional new ordinance on the 26th that just addresses that one small item on the billboard and, and advertising. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's, you have to do it, you have to add the billboard piece separately because it wasn't noticed and, you, and so it has to 
So it'll have to. Uh, I get, but it, but wouldn't that that would get that would get us through the first reading of all the other advertising piece, and then we'd have a second ordinance coming now. Well, remember, we're not actually making any changes to our sign ordinance, right? I mean, in the end, wh whatever version of the language, there's actually practically no change okay. to our sign ordinance. Sure. So we aren't holding anything up for the two weeks before we hear this again. Okay, sure. In toto. Okay, so uh, we have a motion and we have a second. Let me just briefly state um, that I, uh, <coughs> Uh, I appreciate that uh, what was brought to us today, I think we wanna make sure um, we shouldn't almost never have laws that put our local businesses at a disadvantage uh, to businesses outside the county. And so supporting our local businesses is crucial. And the second part is I really appreciate that staff is looking through these uh, ordinances because we were, we were on the forefront of trying to create laws and, and we're gonna need to tweak and improve and we shouldn't be making things in any realm, uh, whether it's cannabis or for someone trying to install a hot water heater or for someone to put solar on the roofs, we shouldn't be making it more complicated than it needs to be. And so bringing us back the changes to simplify things uh, should, always be, um, should always be the inclination of our staff and I wanna thank you for bringing that to us today. Uh, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, that passes unanimously. We're now gonna hear item 10.2, uh, which is to cons uh, consider uh, a proposed ordinance amending Santa Cruz County Code by adding 7.136 relating to cannabis equity and to schedule for final adoption on March 26, 2019 uh, as outlined in the memorandum by Supervisor Leopold, Leopold and myself. Uh, uh, sure. uh, Chair, let me uh, just uh, present and first of all, uh, I will uh, acknowledge at the beginning that it's unusual to come up with something that's a late addition. Um, the state issued their guidelines for this uh, local grants program on Friday, March 1st. On Monday, March 4th, uh, Ms. Corral uh, sent me, and I think all of us, a email alerting us to this. Uh, on Tuesday, I reached out to Mr. Laforte to find out what it is we would need to do about this, and at the time, after uh, reading uh, SB 1294, uh, it seemed like we didn't need an ordinance that we actually just needed a resolution. Um, and that was, so that was not a crisis situation because a resolution is, is a, we could do that on March 26th, but in an, uh, the abundance of caution, I asked Mr. LaForte to check with the Board of Cannabis Control to ensure because the application uh, is clearly states that you need to include your ordinance. Um, they don't provide a phone number uh, to figure out how you do, so uh, Mr. LaForte had to be like everybody else and write an email. He received that email on uh, at 8.45 p.m. on Friday night, informing him that we needed to include an ordinance. And um, on Monday morning, uh, I, I reached out to Mr. Heath at uh, at approximately 11 a.m. and between all the other things going on on Monday, we've finally completed this in, the, in uh, with moments to spare. So this is not normal, um, and uh, one might argue that the st the state board of cannabis control d uh, did this to make it hard for more communities to have a local equity ordinance. Uh, the uh, there were only five jurisdictions. Uh, that had a local equity ordinance as of last week. Um, there's a couple more who are trying to get in. There are lots of communities who um, who are not gonna be able to, to move as nimbly as we might be able to here today. Um, this ordinance is something that we've discussed. Uh, uh, Supervisor Coonerty brought it to our attention and we really didn't have a way in which to, to, to make this a reality. Um, with this local grants program, we have an opportunity to, uh, to get some money and there's $10 million worth of funds with no grants being less than $100,000 uh, to be able to have a program to, to uh, reach uh, communities who have been disproportionately affected uh, by, the, uh, by the criminalization of cannabis and others who are offering compassionate uh, services. Uh, and uh, when Ms. Corral made it of, uh, me aware of it, you know, uh, she has been 
declared in uh, court filings as the gold standard of, uh, of uh, cannabis uh, distribution or uh, something to, uh, akin to that. Uh, and so uh, to the extent that we might be able to attract some fund to fund our operation uh, and to help out others who have been affected uh, so we could reach this equity, it seemed worthwhile to bring that to the board um, for consideration. So I, I share that and uh, Mr. LaForte played a, uh, and Mr. Heath played a, a great role in assembling this uh, quickly uh, and they can answer technical questions on it, but th hopefully we would get this money and be able to help out others in our community. Uh, is there any questions from board members? I'll open it up to public comment. Um, hi, Pat Malo. Um, I'm so, so happy about this. I'm also pleasured to have uh, served on the WAM board for a few years now, and this is a really big deal, and hopefully, you know, other groups in the community can get some of this money too. So I just want to say thank you so much. Um, good job. This is really quite extraordinary, and it's actually something we've been waiting for for decades. And one of um, you know the utilization of these grant monies in a successful program could perhaps encourage not only other organizations in our community and throughout the state of California to employ more compassionate access and philanthropy toward people who are sick and dying, and therefore financially disenfranchised. Again, this is our community on the cutting edge of service and really getting what cannabis, the legalization of it today, of recreational use, was built on the backs of people who are sick and dying. And those are the people that are now forced into the black market because of high costs, over taxation, and the inability to access compassionate um, cannabis from people. So that's really one of the great problems that we're facing. I know this firsthand because I deal with these people. And um, would otherwise be one myself if I didn't grow it. So thank you, appreciate your help. And I echo the appreciation that uh, Valerie and Pat have expressed. And uh, we'd like to make jokes about government time, but I think that you demonstrated here that uh, government can work for the people and, and you did an extraordinary job and I appreciate it. I'd also like to point out that this is perhaps uh, the first time that the uh, board has taken an action that is uh, less regulatory and more uh, focused on economic development. And that's something that uh, I've been kind of uh, begging you to do for uh, several years now, and, and I'm glad to see that we've kind of moved on that road. The, uh, it's not over. This is a big first step, but now we uh, need to get applicants uh, and proposals into the state and compete with Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Oakland. San Diego is uh, looking to pass an ordinance today. Long Beach has one. So it will not be a, a slam dunk, but I, um, I'm hopeful that we can um, uh, make this work for the county. Thank you. Good morning, my name is uh, Seth Smith. I'm a partner with Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance and a resident of Santa Cruz County. I'd like to thank the board, uh, Supervisor Coonerty, Supervisor Leopold especially, for bringing this issue forward. Um, the equity grant program would be uh, relatively significant uh, assistance for uh, some of the businesses here in Santa Cruz County, uh, not just our own and WAM, uh, but uh, as you, many of you know, Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance has maintained our compassionate, com our compassionate care program since Prop 64 took effect last January. Uh, we were one of the only licensed groups in the state uh, to do so, primarily just because WAM uh, has, has been uh, uh, still working on getting their doors open. Once they are, they'll be back on board with that. In the time being, uh, we've been working very closely with the state to ensure that we were able to continue to do this. Uh, we've been audited by CDTFA several times. We even hit us up for back taxes for cannabis that we gave away for free to medical patients under Prop 215. Um, we still pay cultivation tax on all the cannabis that we give away for free uh, at the state level. So uh, with regard to uh, letters of support, if you guys wouldn't mind also supporting SB 34, which would give, allow us the opportunity to recoup those taxes on the cannabis that we donate for free, that would be great as well. 
Um, also, uh, other organizations like Big Peach Treats, which is a local Santa Cruz County manufacturer, one of the first manufacturing licenses awarded by the state, has begun to recommit uh, a portion of the products that they make to our uh, compassion program as well. So we're, they're not just the dispensaries, but some of the local manufacturers here in Santa Cruz County who have been very committed to compassion since the beginning and are now finding their way back to it would potentially be able to benefit as well. So uh, thank you very much for taking this on. Um, we look forward to uh, working with you on that. And if there's any questions about what a proposal might look like uh, from an organization going to the state through the, through the county, uh, we'd be happy to uh, help answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you. So that'll close public comment and I'll bring it back to the board for discussion and action. Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for bringing this item forward. I'm in support of the item. I do have some concerns about some of the language to ensure that we're actually accomplishing what we want. Uh, the eligibility cr criteria under 7.136070 seems exceedingly vague to me. Uh, and I feel like that the board has always wanted to advantage those that are actually giving things away as opposed to those that are selling things and a small percentage of what they do is give things away. Uh, but under this construct, uh, while compassionate care is actually the only enumerated item, it would leave a significant amount of interpretation into the CLO about what uh, would constitute somebody meeting the eligibility criteria here. So I wanted to see that in regards to the vets or in regards to WAM, which have a demonstrated history of giving, uh, of doing compassionate care, and, and obviously their business model is not focused on uh, monetization, but rather on compassionate care, why we're not uh, defining as a percentage of business or something more specific that would ensure uh, that these, that the only people that are actually really eligible for this are people that this is what they're doing within our community, not those that are, uh, are in essence benefiting financially. Since you two drafted it, maybe you could answer that, or, or if you. Uh, yeah, I think, I think, it I think as Supervisor Leopold referenced, the state didn't do us any favors on this by giving us a month and then a two-week turnaround to get an ordinance on file. And what I what I view this is is a is a very bare bones ordinance. It's not the kind of ordinance that we would typically bring to your board after months of well thought study and drafting. We were put in a position to put ourselves uh, in eligibility for this grant program, but in order to do it, we had to get an ordinance on file. And what I would, what I would suggest, and I, I think that what staff plans to do, is come back to your board with changes to this ordinance that would put more metrics around the eligibility criteria and, um, and some other things in place to uh, make less problematic that vague language that you're talking about and clean it up in some other areas as well. Thank you. I mean, that, that's my interest. I mean, my interest yeah. is, is that we want to advantage the compassionate care programs, not just people that are making a lot of money off the backs of patients. And currently the language doesn't do that, and so uh, that would be how I would support it if I knew that it was coming back with that kind of language. <coughs> yeah, let me just say, so when I first brought up the equity ordinance, it actually had nothing in the context of our creation of other ordinances, it actually had nothing to do with compassionate care. It was about expanding opportunity to, to especially minority communities that have been disproportionately uh, impacted by the criminalization and giving them now the opportunity to succeed in the commercial market. So, um, and the state seems to have married uh, the two of those concepts, and so, um, which I think is great, and that's that's the overall vision we want to go to, but I am interested in um, uh, the businesses that can show that they've been, uh, and especially minority communities, that haven't had the same access and, in fact, suffered the negative consequences of criminalization. Um, and now want to participate in a legal market, that's, 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 an, important, that's an important value for this community as well. I, I think once we get a chance to, to sit down when it's not kind of a fire sale, like, like uh, we, yeah. we, we, will, we will have an opportunity to think about all those things and bring you back kind of a more robust program than what is, than what is set forth here right now. Um, uh, but we recommend that if your board is interested in being eligible for these grants, that you adopt a staff recommendation today, get this on the books to allow us to check the right box when those applications are submitted on April 1st. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'd like to compliment um, Supervisors uh, Leopold and Coonerty for bringing this to us and thank the staff for its uh, quick criteria, uh, getting this together. Um, how long did, if we wanted to come back and review what we've, has been discussed, uh, how long would you like a lead time? It'd be great to maybe have come back in three months, or I don't know how long it might take. Uh, I'd, I'd hope we could come back 
um, sooner than that. Sure I mean, that. Maybe, maybe I, m my intention would be like 45 days, something like that. I, I'd like to you know, set a date, a time specific, then that you could come back within 45 days and whatever that next uh, that board meeting falls, however that falls. Six. It would be your May 14th meeting. May 14th. Thank you. Uh, if you if, yeah. uh, accept that, and I just want to thank, uh, I think we have tremendous examples, uh, example here really, uh, thanks to Valerie Corral, Corral and, and Wham, uh, I think this puts in great positions. We know how to do it, and our VFW too has, has also done, uh, veterans have done so much for this too. I think we're going to be in a great position to provide some compassionate services that are much needed in this area. So I appreciate the board members, the staff, and those who have uh, let us by example, so we have we can show them this is how we should do it, and uh, it's how successful it's been. So I want to thank them. Is there a motion? Yeah. yeah. So I'd be <coughs> I'd be prepared to uh, to move the recommended actions. Ask uh, that our uh, uh, our staff come back on at our May 14th meeting with uh, more specific criteria, both around compassionate compare compassionate care and um, the inclusion of minorities or, uh, uh, or disproportionately affected communities. Um, motion. So we got a motion by Leopold and a second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. So now, um, <coughs> now we are moving on to item, uh, formerly item 35, uh, which uh, got, was pulled by Supervisor McPherson to approve the release of the RFP, uh, request for proposals for a trans recycling center operation services at the Buena Vista landfill and the Ben, Lotion, ben Loman transfer station and direct public works to return to on or before June 25th, 2019 with a recommendation for award of contract and take related actions as recommended by the deputy CA and the direct director of public works. And so I think, uh, Supervisor. Yeah, I, I think um, I have some comments that I do want to make, but I know some folks from Valley Women's Club that has been operating these uh, or uh, these uh, recycling centers up in San Rosa Valley. I'd like to hear from them first, if we <coughs> could, and then uh, then move from there. Sounds great. <coughs> so now uh, we will open public comment. Thank you, Bruce. We want to hear the whole thing though. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Nancy Macy. I live in Boulder Creek, and I was among the Valley Women's Club members who helped found the very, very, very first recycling centers in the center, uh, a drop-off once a month in Boulder Creek in 1978. And I was honored to be founding director of the SLV Redemption Recycling Centers, a service of the Valley Women's Club in three locations in the San Lorenzo Valley. The job has been, uh, was and has been an exciting challenge because everything was new, everything kept changing, and it grew very fast. Um, over time, we were proud to help the county in meeting its state-required diversion goals by providing convenient round-the-clock drop-off opportunities, coupled with the chance uh, for locals to cash in their CRV beverage containers. Um, we were really grateful to all the markets who agreed to cash the script and hang on to it for a month and send us a monthly bill so we didn't have to have cash at the sites. What a benefit that has been. They've been doing it for 30 years. Um, we were happy to accept uh, when asked by the county to accept more materials because it met our own environmental goals. We were grateful when offered a contract to help with costs of, of uh, handling and transporting those additional materials because they had low or negative value. We were excited to take on the challenge of operating the much larger recycling operations for the Ben Loman Transfer Station when the county asked us to do so. We were happy to hire more men and women to operate the sites, providing training in both basic skills like operating a calculator and more advanced skills like operating a forklift, making repairs and handling challenging materials using complex processing, processing equipment from, ba from balers to Freon extraction systems. We were especially glad to prov uh, pro provide jobs that became careers for many of our team of employees. Uh, 
Now I am retired, I'm honored and proud that the SLV Redemption Recycling Centers have continued to serve the community in three sites with 24 hour drop off. And I wanna honor the uh, employees whose loyalty and dedication, their willingness to weather cuts in hours when needed or being required to move from site to site, their ability to perform the complex requirements of the CRV system and handle and process dangerous materials while providing good service to the community. We are very proud of the monumental amount of materials that have been recycled, thousands and thousands of tons, and we are very proud that we have offered an extraordinary value to the county uh, in providing the services required under our contract. I'm deeply saddened that our team members are facing the loss of their careers and that so many locals will be forced to travel to Santa Cruz or Capitola to redeem their bottles and cans if they can even get there. Thank you. I think that's all. Sorry, okay. Okay. Next speaker. Good afternoon, and thanks for having us. My name is Matt Harris. I'm the current director of the SLV Redemption Recycling Centers. I'm here just to speak briefly about the citizenship of the San Lorenzo Valley. Once, if we're not able to keep the CRV component in this particular contract coming up, there's roughly 20,000 people that will be no longer be able to take their CRV and actually have it cashed. So there's gonna be a huge deficit up in North County, and it's actually gonna fall squarely on uh, Costco. They're, they're the next defense in line. Also, to kind of harken back, I've been with the Valley Women's Club for 25 years. I started out at 25 years old at $5 an hour. The Valley Women's Club takes chance on people like me that have learning disabilities that are dyslexic. And it's really nice to be able to bring other like-minded people together, give them a skill, give them a place to work, and give them a voice in the community. And uh, I really can't put too strong of an emphasis on that um, because before Nancy took me on board, I didn't really feel like I was worth much in the workplace because I didn't know how to spell very well or I couldn't add very well. So it was a great place for us to grow and we continue to reach out to folks like that that face the significant challenges like I did and still do and give them a voice and a place to work. So. We understand that the state isn't gonna come to our rescue for the CRV, we know that. Uh, they're sitting on $320 million that I have desperately tried to reach through legislation. I help write bills. I've done everything I could possibly do to try to get that money to come down to Santa Cruz County, and I have failed. Um, so I say this with the greatest humility. I do urge you all to revisit this and look at the, the, the impact that it will have once we close. And once we do close, we will be gone. Um, it took. 25 years to build this company, and it's gonna take a significant amount of time to take it apart. Thank you very much for your time, and I really appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, my name is Wendy harris Guen. I am a resident of Felton, and I'm also a board member uh, for the board of directors of the Valley Women's Club, which has been operating the recycling centers in Felton, Ben Lomond, and Boulder Creek for 30 years. Our board has voted to bid on the new RFP, but we're extremely pessimistic about the possibility of continued involvement with the RFP in its current form. Processing recyclables with a CRV or cash redemption is an integral part of the services that we bring people, that brings people to our recycling centers. By providing this service, we incentivize people to bring us not only their CRV items, but other recyclables that may have otherwise ended up in a landfill or worse, dumped on the side of our forest roads like we really too often already see. Due to the economics of the recycling market, a standalone CRV center is not currently a viable financial option. It's not a financially viable business model. Therefore, with the likely closing of our recycling centers, there will be no CRV operations anywhere in the San Lorenzo Valley after June 30th, reducing overall CRV redemption locations in Santa Cruz County by almost half from seven centers to four. The majority of those our centers serve are San Lorenzo Valley residents, redeeming their lawful CRV refund and dropping off their recyclables. Many of our residents are low income, disabled, and we, extremely, we are extremely concerned that these vulnerable members of our community will be unable to obtain the often crucial income they receive from CRV redemption. For many of these community members, getting, the Santa Cruz, getting to Santa Cruz, carrying bags of containers is an insurmountable barrier, and loss of these recycling centers will have a drastic impact on their ability to provide for themselves. 
The Valley Women's Club remains dedicated to our mission of protecting and preserving our environment in the San Lorenzo Valley and beyond. We regret the potential loss of this partnership with the county that has allowed us to provide such an important service. We intend to continue to push for improvements to the current CRV system and to encourage our state legislators to provide new incentives, allowing in-state plastic, glass, and aluminum processing plants to improve recycling services beyond the CRV system. Hopefully there will be more opportunities in the future for the Valley Women's Club to collaborate with the county around this and other important issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors, Tim Bratt and Gray Bears. Um, just heard all that. And um, so we've been doing it for 30 years also with your, as your partner at Chanticleer, if you threw a, a bullseye in the center of the county, you'd land about 50 feet from our property. So we're strategic, uh, strategically located to provide uh, recycling services. Pound for pound, uh, Gray Bears takes in more material than either of the two other facilities in the county. And we do that through both curbside materials and large quantities. Uh, we, uh, I think one advantage that uh, centers have is uh, source separation. You get the highest value for what, what people bring us, but also for what you can't put in curbside, which is uh, computers, TVs, right, electronics, printers. Last year, this year we'll do 190,000 pounds of printers. You can't put those really realistically in a bin. Uh, styrofoam is something that I know is championed by Supervisor Friend. A few years ago, we were begged to take it on uh, a grant, actually with the Valley Women's Club. Originally, didn't weren't able to put it in, into uh, operation, but we were with help from the uh, Community Foundation. And this year, we'll do 35,000 pounds of this material. Now, just to visualize what this material is, it's a th almost a third of a mile, eight feet by eight feet cube of material that we will uh, densify this year. It densifies at 90 to one. It uh, doesn't biodegrade. It's 500 year life capacity, lifespan, and it gets in the ocean really easily. Curbside, you can cram it in your curbside container and it, it spills out, it gets in the gutters and it goes in the ocean and fish eat it and now it's in the food chain. It's one plastic that we're able to really uh, provide a really great service for. That is in question now with this decision to defund Gray Bears. Uh, it's not a big grant, it's a critical grant. And I think that when you uh, recognize the value of that, in addition, in that tonnage figure, what's not shown in that uh, recycling is um, things that we refurbish and resell to mostly, predominantly to low-income residents uh, in our thrift store. 600 square feet, 150 tons of material go through there at very low cost to uh, low-income uh, seniors and uh, school-aged children. So I urge you to consider, reconsider uh, your decision on this or the uh, staff decision and know that all of this work we do uh, f sends food out to uh, 4,000 seniors a week uh, in the county and a program also in meals and in donated hours, 1,000 uh, volunteers, 89,000 hours of service to make our programs work. Thanks a lot. Thank you. That concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board, yeah. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to uh, pull this from the agenda. And I want to thank, uh, in particular, the Valley Women's Club, which is in my district, uh, for helping uh, Santa Cruz County meet its uh, recycling uh, goals for many, many years. And I want to thank Public Works to uh, fa facing somewhat uh, some realism and bringing this to the board. And a lot has changed in the recycling world, as we know, and it's certainly not all for the good. Uh, the marketplace is really collapsed uh, and the measure in strong measure because uh, China has quit accepting plastics from the United States. Uh, we all know that we need to change our recycling programs to adjust to this re new reality. And recently, along with Supervisor Friend, I support a resolution to the state supporting uh, the formation of a recycling commission to figure out some solutions. And I think the state could help us out and not put us in this predicament that we're in today, but it is what it is. And we have to realize that for many years, the Valley Women's Club uh, has offered fantastic public service to the residents of the San Lorenzo Valley and Felton and Ben Loman and Boulder Creek with some recycling centers, and as well as Gray Bears, uh, who we, we really appreciate the amazing service for, that they have done and uh, supporting the meals for seniors. Um, meanwhile, our Public Works Department 
which has helped to supp uh, supplement these local operations for many years, um, is already challenged by limited state and federal funding to address other facets of it, its uh, duties, uh, particularly on roads and other priorities. Um, and while this um, is an opportunity for um, realizing, you know, to rethink these ideas, I think we do have, I do have a few concerns on how we're gonna try to solve them <coughs> here. And they, they're really in three different segments. And the first one is um, environmental. And I'm uh, speaking uh, particularly to the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, Losing Felton and Boulder Creek drop-off sites could, could lead to more illegal dumping and litter, and we have discussed that at the board and tried to meet that challenge as best we can. But I, I'm afraid that this could even more, could cost even more to our county uh, for abatement and court, code enforcement. So environmental is one of them. Um, economic, which has been uh, mentioned already, we have uh, several um, low-income families in the, valleys that rely on CRV, and if the county is no longer going to support that service, uh, what are the options of these folks, uh, folks to obtain that? Um, and what will happen to local retailers if the CRV goes away? Um, I'm also worried about the people losing their jobs, as was mentioned, um, if the current organizations do not receive the contracts that are uh, proposed today. Um, and data, we, we need uh, some data about the amount of material recycled at the satellite uh, uh, sites because uh, if those centers close, we're, uh, we'll be much more, um, we'll have much more recycled material to Buena Vista and Ben Lomond. Uh, so I would like to, I'm gonna support moving ahead with this. Um, because our recycling centers are expiring and um, uh, contracts are um, expiring on June 30th, and we have some purchasing guidelines that we must follow if we want to uh, provide the services that uh, we, we desire in the future. But I, I'd like to make three recommendations, uh, and I've given um, the clerk a copy of this uh, proposal. Uh, number one, when a contract uh, comes to the board for adoption, I'd like to see an analysis of the potential impacts to the environment of removing two recycling sites in the San Lorenzo Valley, Felton and Boulder Creek, as well as an analysis of the potential impact to the local community of losing CRV. Uh, two, I'd like to, I'd li also like data to be made available to the board about the tonnage of recycled materials collected at Felton, Boulder Creek, and Chanticleer, which are the three sites that could close as a result of this request for proposal. And finally, number three, I'd like to, I'd also like the evaluation criteria for awarding the contract to include a scoring preference for proposals that agree to offer employment to all qualified displaced workers. Uh, the people that have worked at these uh, sites are phenomenal. Uh, they have provided a tremendous public service. They love what they do. They see it as a public service and really having a, a really positive impact on protecting our environment. So with, with that direction, uh, I would like to move uh, adoption of, um, or rec I'd like to move this uh, recommendation with the uh, additional directives that I have mentioned in this. Uh, Second. So we got a, a motion by McPherson and a second by uh, Leopold. Can I get clarification on what you've given the yeah. clerk of the board, Supervisor McPherson? You have um, three, oh. closing three of so them? So uh, just to restate, um, it's my understanding that you have a, uh, the, the move the staff recommendation. I understand, oh, but he, yeah. and what he, what he wrote what and what he, he said were slightly different. What he said was, yeah. what and he I, read I, into here, it was slightly was, different. I always thought it was delivered yeah. to you. I'll, Okay, so yeah. it's actually three the sites. The three satellite okay. centers yeah. in the San Lorenzo Valley and the Mid-County. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you, you for clarification. And that's okay with the second. Okay, so we got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor McPherson, for adding these ad additional pieces uh, on here. I think they're critically important. We, uh, the community has led the county when it comes to recycling. The county, the, the, the county has a, a great robust program, but it was programs like Valley Women's Club and Chanticleer who um, have been on the front end of this movement about uh, recycle and reuse. Uh, and uh, they've been great partners. 
And in addition to their work in terms of diverting uh, material from our landfill, they also provide additional public benefit. Um, uh, I'm less familiar with Valley Women's Club, although I, I know their their environmental work in the in the in the uh, valley is extraordinary. But I know that Gray Bears um, provides critical resources to seniors who live uh, in our county throughout the county, um, and their model of uh, recycle and reuse um, it has been core uh, to uh, not only their environmental ethos. Uh, but their, their economic model to be able to support all the good work that's going on. Um, I'm also uh, am concerned about the possibility of losing uh, the recycling center at, at the Chanticleer site. Um, this board uh, has been supportive of lots of different things to, to address congestion in our community, but uh, anybody knows, uh, uh, if you if you're if you can't go to Chanticleer and now you have to drive down to South County uh, to deliver your materials and much worse even from other parts of the county, um, <laughs> you're committing a significant amount of time <clears throat> and and adding to the congestion on our roads. And so a, a mid-county uh, transfer site actually uh, works out very well for many different people. I appreciate the work that the, the department has done to, to meet with Gray Bears, to talk about the RFP, to encourage creativity in the response to that RFP, um, and their willingness to, uh, to uh, look at uh, what, what we talked about as a holistic program rather than just these couple of different elements. Um, we want to be very careful as we as we make changes to these contracts because, as was pointed out by the speakers, uh, once you lose these kind of community-based programs, they don't just spring up on their own. Um, it take, it's taken years for these programs to uh, uh, be su uh, successful uh, and to have the different pieces in there. So looking at these, um, both uh, uh, environmental impacts and uh, other impacts to the community will be uh, critically important. Uh, lastly, uh, should there be a change of vendors uh, at, the, uh, at uh, any of these sites, um, trying to make sure that qualified workers who are already working there um, have positions with the new vendor is also important. I know that we included that as part of our look, when we looked at our waste services contract, that's, uh, that's common and, and uh, I think it's important to be able uh, to assure that people who've made a lifelong commitment and that are qualified uh, might be able to keep their jobs. So I strongly support this and I encourage my colleagues to join us. Thank you, any other comments? I just, uh, I'll make it quick. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Chanticleer is another it's a term that's uh, the gray bears run, uh, yeah. run that. And uh, they're doing a great program. I think it's actually bringing in more money than it actually, uh, you know, costs to operate. Am I correct? <laughs> <laughs> it's bringing in, but I mean, uh, it's not, how, how much is it? Uh, uh, it yeah. Sorry, Tim. Yeah, Tim. I ask? Yeah. So are, are we referring to the recycling operation? Yeah. Are we, um, we're currently, it's been a rough year, and it was even rougher in 2008 when cardboard was even half of what it is now. We were all in the same way, but today we're going to lose probably somewhere in the vicinity uh, north of about ninety to to $100,000 in, in the recycling operation alone at Chanticleer. Not including the RFP is the two items I discussed earlier, electronics and styrofoam. And those are, they take up a lot of space, uh, especially styrofoam. It's turned out that it's a whole thing on its own. And so it's been a cost center for us. It doesn't, it loses a lot uh, um, in, in that equation. Okay. So. Let's see your point. Okay, and what about the Valley, uh, the Valley Women's, uh, as far as, yeah. 
sorry, wasn't able to hear you. Um, once we crunched our numbers, about 40,000 uh, that we lost, and largely in part that's due to the new imposed tariffs, the China backing out, uh, even some CRV components we're actually having to pay a bit for. So uh, it's, you know, I have to kind of touch upon this, that this is not a money-making endeavor. We look at it as a nonprofit side, as long as we're self-sustaining with our partners, the County of Santa Cruz and others, you know, it's worth doing. So th does that answer your question? Or? Yes, that, okay. that's, that's fine. Thanks very much. I appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you. So we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, I'll ask all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for coming out today and thank you for your patience and waiting to testify. Well, I appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having us. Um, so now we're moving on to item number 10, which is to consider ordinance repealing chapter 4.12 of the Santa Cruz County Code and amending chapters 1.05, 2.16, 2.46, 2.22, 2.84, 4.16, 4.27, 4.28, 4.36, 4.40, 4.50, 4.60, 5.40, 5.41, 5.48, and 5.62 of the Santa Cruz County code to correct typographical errors, address organizational issues, align the code with changes to state law, and delete unnecessary materials to make uh, additional miscellaneous changes as outlined in the memorandum of the County Council. And just for those who may be watching at home, this is a cleanup exercise we're doing to uh, ensure that our county code reflects current law and practices, uh, and Jason Heath is here to, pr to uh, answer any questions that we might have. Good afternoon, Jason Heath with County Council's Office. This is the sixth uh, iteration of the County Code Update Ordinances. Uh, we are uh, trying to remove superfluous language from the County Code and update it to comply with changes that have been made to state law and the like. Uh, this time we are asking for repeal of Chapter 4.12 as that duplicates state law and we are also asking for some miscellaneous changes uh, to settlement authority. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions? Just Sorry. one quick question. I, I, I know that we've gotten rid of some pieces that are uh, superfluous on the bag ordinance, plastic bag ordinance 5.48. We still have what we, uh, what people were charged for bags in the initial startup of the ordinance. I don't know if there was a reason or just to, sh to show that as a model or, um, it's in 5.48.020. Give me just one second to get there. So I'm at 5.48.020, I'm at packet page 141. Can you direct me to where on, you, uh, you are? The, now the revised B, during the period of time starting on the date of the ordinance codified in this chapter takes effect. And continuing for one year thereafter. Yeah. Um, you know, that, 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 that language, um, staff did not impart to me that they had any changes to the, the, uh, the amount that we're charging for the bags. Um, if you have, if your board is interested in changing the amount. No, uh, no, I, I, that's not what I was suggesting. I apologize uh, for not being clear. The, the, what we did when we instituted an ordinance and what it says here is in that, in the first year we were gonna, ch we we're only gonna charge 10 cents for someone needing a bag. And then after that, we're gonna charge 25 cents. And so the, the, the question I had is, why do we keep the first part in there? And, and, and my answer is that there's no good reason to do that. <laughs> and, so, and so what I'll do is, is, uh, is I will, in the seventh county code uh, ordinance, which I know you're waiting patiently for, um, I will include that. Okay, I, I, I just noticed it when I was reading it. I'm fascinated by reading all these ordinances. Thank you. Uh, uh, that makes one of us. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> um, okay. Some of us are wonks. <laughs> are, there, are there any public comments on this? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, I would move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Leopold, second by uh, Kaput. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Uh, moving on, we're on item number uh, 10.1, to consider the final reappointment of Andy Schifrin to the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners as an outlawed representative for a term to expire March 17th, 2023. I move approval. Second. 
uh, got a motion by Leopold and a second by Friend. Any public comment? Seeing none, bring it back to the board. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll now be uh, moving into closed session. Will, will there be any reportable action? No. All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>